Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the bearable bull here. And I got this aggressively average content for you today. As men, oh man, do I have a powerful video for all of you today. Here, the title of this video is called The Perfect XRP Exit Strategy and Profit Taking Strategy. And while there is no perfect cookie cutter exit strategy for every single person on the planet, this is the perfect strategy for me. And something that I've been very critical of recently are the outlandish five to six figure XRP price predictions. The reason is because it's dissuading people from taking profits and actually making real world progress with their money. And innocent retail investors get hurt by having to wait long periods of time for values that may or may not be achieved. And that is why I'm here today spending hours speaking with a chart analyst that during the peak of the hype was grounded and took profits from XRP as we were going towards the peak and probably made more money from XRP than 99% of you. At the end of the day, my friends, it's about making money. While I am fundamentally a long-term investor, I understand the world stage and where we are. We're in a place where there will be a cataclysmic financial crisis in the not-too-distant future. And what all of you need to understand is, I think it's possible that XRP could see nice price appreciation before that crisis happens. I think that could be the speculative bull run that we've all been waiting for to finally make some money. And because of this, I'm going to tell all of you that I will be de-risking gradually from this market, especially with XRP, because capital, access to cash will be extremely important to be able to buy up the blood on the streets that is inevitable, that 100% will happen. I've been very vocal about stating that a 15 to 20 dollar XRP price is where I think we can realistically go with the settlement, a decision in this case, and some speculation as well as a utility bull run. But despite that fact, I have earlier price targets that I'll be taking some money out of as well, as I think it'll be smart, because then we'll be able to protect ourselves financially. The math makes a lot of sense. I call this strategy dollar cost selling. And after this interview with Waters Above Crypto, I believe plenty of people are going to gain a very great perspective on how to attack and make money in this market. And when we could be seeing different price fluctuations in the crypto space. Waters Above Crypto uses some unconventional esoteric methods to accompany his analytical TA skills. And while I was skeptical at first, he definitely opened my mind to the accuracy with which he plays this game. I highly recommend all of you take the time out to listen to the complete interview, as you guys will have learned a lot, just like I did. My new XRP exit strategy has been formulated with a lot of the logic and reason that Waters Above Crypto used. And I hope if nothing else, you use me as a reference to help ground your guys' profit-taking strategies. Let me know if you can hear my mic clearly. Now I can hear it. Perfect, perfect. Beautiful, beautiful. What's good? Hey, everything's amazing. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, for those of you in the audience... Um, I'm very grateful that you guys are here, whether you're one of my clients or one of wa Waters Above community members. It's going to be a fun, very laid back conversation. We're going to get deep into the real world, the esoteric world, the TA world and everything in between. Um, you've been a very heavily requested individual by my community. You give a very grounded approach that, um, you know, most people may not necessarily be familiar with. And I want nothing more but to give you the stage, be able to talk about a lot of the things um, you see and really just have a lot of fun with it and, and see if people really get something valuable out of it today, my friend. So 
I guess I'll start by saying, um, if you want to introduce yourself, um, maybe talk a little bit about your background, what it is you do on your channel and, and how you go about tackling this crypto market as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for reaching out to me and having me on. I really appreciate it. It was great talking with you before we organized this interview and shout out to anyone who told you to have me on. Uh, it really means a lot to me. And there's definitely a lot of crossover between people that are in your community, people that follow my work as well. So it's all love. And um, I guess just a quick introduction. I basically do technical analysis. I was a professional trader. I still do some trading here and there, but I am essentially combining gamatria, numerology, and astrology to decode the financial markets. And this is to expose the more esoteric metrics that are actually moving the stock market and cryptocurrencies. And I know that a lot of people are aware of astrology, zodiac, and perhaps even numerology, but uh, with gamatria, it's helped me to identify price targets and dates specifically for those cryptocurrencies. And it is a groundbreaking system. It's very new. It's very unique. Um, mm -hmm. Initially, people are confused by it because it's pretty esoteric, but I try my best to be calm and simplify everything that I do regarding using those more esoteric uh, protocols. But then with my work, I'll go into the technical analysis so that way I could show you in the charts what's going on. This way, if the decoding stuff is not for you, you could at least look at it from a chart, a charting perspective. And I've combined both of those together to create somewhat of a unique strategy that reveals uh, what's going on in this market. Now, before we continue with anything else, Waters, something I'll tell you is um, personally, I've always believed Jamatri is bullshit. I'm just being real with you. The reason is because I'd always see um, underneath David Schwartz's comments about him making toast in the morning, somebody posting 589 equals Donald Trump being the new world order, some bullshit, right? <laughs> and I'm just being real with you. However, however, I've been told um, that most people, when they analyze this specific and use this specific tool, use it completely incorrectly or completely misinterpret things and they don't know what they're doing. And I've been told you actually do it in a grounded way that is more correct, right? And more conducive with reality. So I'm get, I'm, I'm being open-minded. I'm giving it a chance. And before anyone asks, um, I haven't asked him to provide me with any evidence of, of any of this. I've, I've told him um, I do want to be um, enlightened like live during this interview. So there's no, there's no prior context. I'm learning as we go. And I, I'm asking curious questions um, as we proceed, my brother. So I'm very, I'm very much looking forward to seeing um, how you go about your business as well, my friend, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. And I, I appreciate the uh, honesty. And I think being a skeptic to it is definitely a, a normal response that i get and i'm i appreciate people not just completely you know jumping in on a new system without doing you know their due diligence and trying it out for themselves but i'll let people know um regarding your statement that people are taking full blown sentences and then the 589 thing and decoding tw uh, the tweets from uh you know people in ripple or whatever i i agree with you a lot of the gamatria that i see it's it's baseless and it has no foundation in much of anything. And a lot of those mm. people don't know much about uh, mathematics at all. They don't know about prime numbers. They might not know too much about Fibonacci or so it goes deep. And for me, um, I was lucky because I had a lot of background in esoterica. I, I was studying mythology, studying a, a lot of really like symbolic stuff that the mainstream doesn't get into and gamatria is already quite a hidden concept and idea but mm -hmm. with that being said my methodology was i discovered that all these cryptocurrencies whether it's the company behind the cryptocurrency like specifically ripple or the token itself it actually ties back to something in the mythologies and this is on this is undeniable that everything in our world ties back to these mythologies. If you look mm -hmm. at the way the court system operates, the court system is very Saturnalian. It's all kind of based in that energy. And people could go out of their way to research this if they would like. You know, that would take a lot to get into on this call. But money 
in and of itself has a lot of water symbolism. You know, the the word currency, the current and the sea. And when you think about ripple, where do you hear that term, the ripple effect, which happens in water? Yeah. And you'll start to see that a lot of this stuff that revolves around money is tied back to things like the moon. It's tied back to the, the waters. And that is where the uh, combination of my work with the mythology, tying it to the cryptos, and then decoding based off of that with Gamatria, it has mm-hmm. some basis and foundation in something. So with Satoshi Nakamoto, for instance, of course, we all know this is a mythological uh, entity. It's not a real person, but again, it's the mythology here. And it's really important that people are aware that Satoshi Nakamoto is tied to Saturn. And it's amazing in Gamatria, just to give you, um, since you're more, you're new to this, Saturn mm-hmm. in Gamatria equals 21, and Bitcoin has 21 million coins circulating in supply. And you'll see that that number 21 ties back to Bitcoin a lot. Uh, you probably know about the number 33. It's a really powerful mm-hmm. number. It's talked about in secret societies, etc. We know Jesus allegedly died at the perfect age of 33 years old. All of those numbers are are significant, but particularly 33. And the last yeah. thing I'll say about this is Bitcoin hit 33,000 for the first time ever on the second day of January of 2021. So in the 21 year on the 2-1 date, Bitcoin hit that specific number, actually $33,300. It wicked, hit that price, got rejected on that day, and then it went sideways for a couple of days before further continuation into the finality of uh, pretty much what we would call an alt season that followed that into April and May. Interesting. Now, and I, before... and I could do this all day. There's so many times. I'm, where I'm sure you can do that. Sure yeah, 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 yeah. But... So, so, so we'll we'll go off of your questions. And if there's anything you're confused about regarding specifically the code, I would love to answer it for you. So, something I'll say, um, just for a little context before we continue with anything else is, um, if I were, if this were me trying to learn these things from you five years ago. Um, I probably wouldn't have been interested. However, I've studied um, Carl Jung quite a bit, quite, and I, I think I have almost all of his books, to be honest. And from mm. studying him um, very deeply, I'm very aware that symbolism um, is is very important. And if you pay attention to symbols and and numerology and a lot of these more esoteric things, you'll have a much more complete understanding of this physical reality because it. That is more right hemisphere mental phenomena, right? Like the left brain deals with more of the physical world and logic and reason and math. But the completion of the entire mind comes with this other part, right? And I would love, and I'm actually very much looking forward to how you bring both of these left and right brain um, the phenomenon together very nicely because I've been told you do that very well. So just a little context in that, my friend. I'm very, I'm very excited for this one. <laughs> yeah, it's important to be open minded to this stuff because even things like uh, with my work, when I talk about astrology, I try to keep it really, really simple, and we'll we'll just get into the concept of like moon phases. Like we know we have a full moon and a new moon, and yeah. if we study, if we study when. <clears throat> excuse me, if we study when Bitcoin is hitting all of its all-time highs, it's happening on a new moon. And when we look at all of its all-time lows, it's around full moons. And we know that in the world that if you ask people who are doctors, people who work in emergency rooms, people who are prison guards working in a, in a jail or, or a prison, they have the most chaos going on on the full moon. We have the most rape, murder, crime happening on full moons. Uh, that's indisputable. It's global as well. You could ask all across the world people who work in those professional fields, and there is an energetic change in human behavior. Okay, so whether people want to believe that the market is completely controlled by an entity like a market maker, the Federal Reserve, or central banking system, we are aware that these the market acts accordingly to the lunar cycles as well, because we have the proof in the charts. And if you want to talk about not just cryptocurrency, we can go into the S and P chart. You know, we could go into the Dow Jones, and pretty much got a, a, a hundred years of data to work with. Um, mm. So I've been combining the Hebrew calendar a lot with my work because they put the lunar phases as a very important part of their calendrical system. 
So we could even get into stuff like that with determining dates and why that's so important. And it's not just about the gematria. If people want to just sideline on the gematria stuff and disregard it, that's completely fine because we can talk about just basic astrological phenomenon and how it affects markets. So what I'll say is about that moon thing is like it actually makes quite a lot of sense because it's been noted that the moon um helps govern or governs over water and human beings are comprised mostly out of water so it would correct it would make a lot of sense that our emotional stability would change depending on where the moon is in the sky so uh, you don't have to convince me of that one my friend but 100 so, percent. no go ahead Oh, I was just going to make one final comment that uh, then if the moon plays such a big role, then that means eclipses play such a big role. And we just mm -hmm. watched on the last uh, lunar eclipse that we had, we watched FTT basically drop, you know, 99% of its value. We watched yeah, what happened with FTX and, and Sam Bankman fried And then the prior lunar eclipse that we had, we saw what happened with Terra Luna. That was all on eclipses. And on then the if we go back moon, to right? the... Correct. And if we go back to May of 2021, which was essentially the end of the alt season, it was after we saw XRP hit almost two bucks uh, in that April. That was an eclipse that led to that big market correction. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we could play we could play that game all day, too, with 100 years of chart data going into the S&P and the, just the, the traditional markets and the indices. So that's a really that's a really awesome thing to to consider for most people, because if people have any insight into technical analysis or they just don't give a shit about TA, you can mm -hmm. use these eclipses as a huge part of being able to identify in advance market pivots or big moves in the market or all-time mm -hmm. highs or even black swan events. Powerful. Now, what I guess I'll start with for people that may be watching this later that are more skeptical is, is it possible for you to um let's say go back in time and provide us with some evidence of of you being accurate using these these indicators that you use with different market calls or market events or crashes or maybe even runs like how is it that um you use maybe astrological events or gematria to pinpoint when a market's going to crash or maybe when it's going to rise and everything in between yeah, it's a good question. I mean, for me, a majority of it is given so far in advance that when we zoom in and we were to like pay attention to my content week by week, it starts to cloud a lot of the bigger points. So mm -hmm. I'll say that during the initial uh, phase of my channel rolling out when I was just getting started, which was back in March of 2021, believe it or not, it was mm -hmm. pretty much at the, at the finality of that first uh, big leg up. I was talking about how we should anticipate XRP to break out to $1 for the first time in that four-year cycle, and yeah. it did. And then after that breakout happened, I think a lot of people started paying a little bit more attention to what I had to say. And during that run-up, I was talking publicly about how I was selling my XRP at $1.40, $1.50. And then um, I was doing a little bit of de-risking around $1.76 and $1.86. And this had everything to do with gematria. So with that being said, I was aware that we were going to be going into an eclipse following up in that May. And the fact that we started to see a more dramatic pullback kept my initial bias that I believe Bitcoin was going to go up into an all-time high in Q4 regardless. So I was sharing all the way back in March, April, May, that even though in May we saw that bigger correction into that summertime of 2021 to still anticipate an all-time high by the winter time, or let's just call it uh, Q4 of 2021. And then mm -hmm. we went back up. And uh, I believe we only really saw some isolated projects hit a new high. You know, Ethereum and Bitcoin were the top two. Uh, and then mm -hmm. most things did not actually go up for another leg up. I, I know Solana did pretty well around that time as well as uh, Terra Luna. But then we saw what happened with Terra Luna. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, so throughout that phase leading into um, actually probably back in the summertime, June, July, August of 2021, I was talking publicly about how even if we get all-time highs in this market, we're still probably going to see a 95 to 98% pullback in a majority of these altcoins. And I was saying that when the market was up. So I think 
if we were to dial in the specificity of of the time frame that I revealed to everyone, it was about the Shemitah, which I'm not sure how well aware you are of that seven year cycle, but it has to deal oh, with yeah. the Hebrew calendar. And yep. it's something I was talking about pretty much on every video of my channel for a year, year and a half straight. Mm -hmm. And that was sep that was September of 2022 is when it would be over. And I mm -hmm. told everyone publicly at least a year in advance to anticipate that after the Shemitah, so that means after September 2022, we're going to have two eclipses, which were the ones that we had, uh, one of them being that FTX eclipse that I told you about. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the bottom of the market. That would be the time in the market where you should be seeing these 95 to 98% corrections. Mm -hmm. And as of what two weeks ago, we saw this market head down to another leg lower uh, for a lot of altcoins, not all of them, but we saw what happened with Solana, with Hex Token, et cetera. I mean, so many, even the ISO 222 coins that we pay attention to, right? Like Algorand, HBAR, uh, EOTA, they they weren't looking so good back at the end of the year. Now, mm -hmm. there is an there is an exoteric part to that, which is at the end of the year, you have tax loss harvesting, of course. But if we were to go back in time all the way back a year to an, a year and a half before this even happened, I was publicly stating that regardless of where this market goes to the upside, I still anticipate at that exact time frame to see 95 to 98% losses. Now, if you measure from pretty much any altcoin, you know, except for the ones that did not go into price discovery. The XRP did not go into price discovery. I know you cover that coin a lot. So yeah, yeah. when we look at the general, the general, uh, you know, altcoins that did pretty well in the cycle, uh, all of that came to fruition and it came to fruition at that time frame, And it was revealed over a year before it happened. So I rather look at my work from a perspective of the calls that were made way in advance that are the big volatile, you know, how do you determine the most dramatic oversold part of the market? And then how do you know how to act when the market is up? So mm -hmm. I think my work speaks for that. And if anyone follows my work on the week to week, they're probably just going to get confused and lost unless they're keeping track over a long time frame. Mm -hmm. So another thing I want to say since we're early on in this interview is I don't want to be a predictions guy. Like I moved away from that a while ago. I don't want to be known for my calls that I make or any of that. My overall, um, my goal, if I have to reveal a goal that I have for, for my art is to just have people be more sophisticated investors, to be able to have a more well-developed and more sophisticated investment thesis. I want people to be cal more calm when the market is volatile, I want people to know how to take action because regardless of how specific we could be with so-called predictions, that doesn't mean you're going to take action when the time comes. So that's mm -hmm. really what I want to be for people. Like I want to be somebody that you can be taking this moment until the next time frame that I reveal, develop that investment thesis, create a plan. But then when the time comes, you need to trade that plan. And that's what most people suffer from, brother. They mm. get into these bull markets way too fucking late. They FOMO in and then they they get in at top because they get in when everyone's excited. And then they the people that were in it early when the market goes up, they never created a plan. So they never know when to sell. And it just it's this endless cycle of waiting for influencers to tell them what to do. So yes. I think if I was to be that predictions guy, people would just be waiting around for me to tell them what to do. And that's mm -hmm. not self-reliance. That's slavery. Yes, I want freedom yes, for people. Yes. So I don't give a fuck how accurate my predictions are. Like at the end of the day, that's not what's going to help people become the best version of themselves. What helps people become the best is when you educate people on a skill and that skill will lead them to self-reliance. And uh, that's my mission. Excellent, brother. And I, I feel like that's the most important thing that I want to get across to people as well is because, you know, I there are people that follow me heavily and 2022 was a year that I got completely incorrect right I was I was somebody that I had my initial bias of how the market was going to play out I believed in the theory that we were going to see a similar altcoin run um, or altcoin bull run that we did in 2017 2018 where we got another leg up towards a quarter four or even um, you know in 2022 like some point quarter two right? That was my initial bias. And because I had that initial bias, 
Um, we ended up seeing Black Swan event after Black Swan event, Terra, Celsius, Voyager, FTX, mm-hmm. and that yeah. that sidestep me. And me reflecting on it now, I'm like, damn, I should have looked at those indicators. The DXY was going parabolic. Um, it wasn't the same type of crypto or Bitcoin run up and all time high a pattern that we saw in 2018, where we saw a blow off the top parabolic run. It was more of a double top. So all these Correct. things, and it, it even got someone like me who's been in the market for a long time, right? Like I had and, my and own- me too. Like me yeah. too. I I was I was anticipating Bitcoin hit six figures, and we got the timing right of when that when when it hit all time high. But with mm. regards to the upside targets. No, that did not that did not come yep. to fruition. But see, the thing is, is if we were to just have a de-risking plan and an exit strategy, then we wouldn't be waiting for shit. We would have known like when is it going to be invalidated and how do I take action? So that's a huge thing, right? It's like trading. If you don't have a stop loss or you don't know when you're two in the hole, then mm-hmm. that's on you. So even if Bitcoin doesn't go to six figures, it didn't matter because I sold 70% of my Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's not all about the getting right and wrong shit. It's about the taking action. And, and I making think that's money. where <laughs> making money. <laughs> right. It's turning less money into more money. Yeah. yeah. And and I think a lot of people um they want to leverage on us, which I respect and I'm grateful for in, in some instances, but in some circumstances it provides a, it, it puts a pressure on us. And um, I, I'm not going to let that happen to me in 2023. And it's a real big reason why I shifted my work um, from being solely about crypto to more like consciousness expansion and talking about spirituality and talking about mindset and talking about relationships, talking about all that shit, because that's what you do 99% of the day, right? Mm, like yeah. if you're staring at crypto charts for 99% of your day, then you have a sickness that you need to it's work unhealthy. on. It's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. And and I tell that to people too, because that's what I was, that's the place I was in in 2017, 18. I saw um I saw the whole parabolic run go to new all-time highs. I saw the figure in my in my portfolio. I didn't take profits. Then I saw it go all the way down, just looking at my shit coins get obliterated left and right. And I'm like, damn. Right. That's very unhealthy because you're like, oh, I thought I and I assumed that I had this much money, but I didn't cash out. Now I don't have that money. Now I'm in a bad place. Now I'm depressed. Now I'm sad. Now I lost my job. Now I can't pay bills. And then boom, everything collapses. So I think what Waters Above is is saying is is extremely important because the person and the character traits that you need to embody in order to become the type of person that's going to win in crypto is someone completely different than who you initially were right and that's something i've learned and i'm continuing to learn right i'm not perfect and you guys in here know damn well i'm not perfect so um what you're saying is very powerful my friend and i appreciate that um let's see yeah it's all about perseverance right like what makes greatness stand out is going through losses and getting back up and stop complaining and just fucking put in the work like you needed that 2017 2018 cycle to do the to do this one and like you will refine your process over time and maybe the difference between that cycle and and the recent one was now you have a lot of exposure and you have you're doing the big youtube channel and you have your businesses etc and then mm-hmm. in the next cycle there's going to be some other thing that you're you know facing and you're just going to continue to refine your process and it's the same thing for me it's the same thing for everyone who's listening to this right now like it's not about perfection it's not about being right it's not about predictions it's about like you having balance on the journey and focusing more on the process and less on the outcome okay. And I couldn't agree more, my friend. And before I continue with anything else, for those of you in the audience, um, there is a QA and a tab down below where you can pop in and ask questions that you may want answered throughout the stream. And I'll be looking at that and I'll be asking that to Waters Above. And if you have a question for me as well, I'm more than happy to answer that too. So there'll be a nice Q&A time towards the end where some people can be able to come up and also ask. So I'm keeping that in mind. Um, but let's see, to kind of take this uh, conversation on a bit of a journey, I guess something I'll ask you of is, um, you know, the Shemitah is something that I've looked at um, in the world. And I've often 
um, it's often frightening to think about because it's like the world is governed by a lot of um, esoteric and spiritual thing and symbolic things that a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of. And we did see that massive crypto collapse um, happening towards the, the end of September, towards November and things like that. So what I'll kind of ask you is, um, because what I was expecting during that time was a stock market crash as well. But I didn't, we didn't really get to see that to the level that I thought it would happen. I think people don't question the fact that we're in a recession or that a big financial collapse would probably be coming. My question to you is, when do you think that could possibly happen and, and why? And what do you think could trigger it? And I know you said you don't like getting into predictions, but no, no, it's fine. Through your boundaries a little bit. I like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I appreciate it. Uh, but just to clarify, you're asking me when we could anticipate another leg lower or a potential stock market crash. Was that the question? Um, some along those lines, right? Because what I believe is that the stock market um, it's extremely, it's extremely overbought. Um, we haven't really seen the massive crash that I feel a lot of mm. people anticipate should be coming. And that's really when um, the big financial Perfect. crisis is, is right. So that's something Perfect. that I'm I got to clear now. Yeah, that's something I'm, I've always been concerned about. And Dude, it's in, like if if economics weren't fundamentally distorted and broken, I think we should have been there probably like 2018, 2019, very, very much so 2020 when they locked down the planet. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, to answer your question, um, I could give uh, some, you know, insight for sure and maybe a similar time frame to consider. Um, but I agree with you. We have yet to see the full blown correction that this stock market is capable of. Uh, unfolding into. And I believe we have a lot more downside, uh, especially in the tech sector, but I'll, I'll answer the question holistically. Okay. Um, yeah. We spoke about the Shemitah moments ago. So for anyone who's unaware of what that is, it's a seven year cycle that's uh, practiced in Judaism. And it was typically about agriculture, but ever since the market as, as a whole has become all about speculation, um, it's moved away from that and it's been more utilized in economics. And if you go study all the market crashes in the last hundred years, they're aligning perfectly with these seven year cycles. And from 2021, September to 2022, September, we had this recent Shemitah. Now, why this one in particular is so important is because it is the seventh cycle of the seven Shemitahs, which means it's a 49 into 50 year cycle. This is really, really important for people to be aware because I'm comparing this exact time frame that we've been through in the last year and this year back to 1970s when Nixon was president. We had the Nixon shock, which I'm sure a lot of your audience is aware of what that was like. Cool. Um maybe not live through it, but you know, that's a huge historical event regarding finances and global, the global economic. Um, anyways, I am seeing that the 1970s, early 1970s in particular are just repeating itself. It's like, there's nothing new under the sun and we're mm. seeing the inflation. The inflation is very, very similar, uh, but we're also seeing a very janky market. As you said moments ago, it's like, it, it's, it makes no sense to have had that relief rally that we've gotten in the Dow Jones and um, it was just it was purely insane. Uh, it doesn't match up at all with what's actually happening. And um, something's got to give. So we are in what I'm calling the Jubilee. And now the Jubilee is after seven cycles of seven Shemitah years on the 50th year in Judaism, they practice Jubilee. And, and biblical Jubilee is actually a very positive thing. It would be like returning the land back to people who've had it confiscated from them. Or if you were uh, imprisoned, you would actually be released. So anyways, um, I think they're actually playing that out right now in the transition into this first five or six months of this year, meaning... I do think there's going to be a very positive effect on this uh, stock market and the crypto market into April, but then it's going to lead to a, a sell in May, walk away type energy. And I, I see by September, October, November of 2023, we're going to be seeing the stock market head lower. Now, I also have another set of proof, which is that we typically see a year after the Shemitah is over is when we get the bottom 
in a stock market. <clears throat> so if you mm -hmm. look back at 2020, or sorry, if you look back at 2008, the housing market crash, that was a Shemitah. If you look at 2000, 2001, the dot-com bubble, <clears throat> that was a Shemitah. You go to 1999, you have the bond market. That was a Shmita. You could keep going. 1987, 1986, we saw what happened in the beginning of the Wolf of Wall Street movie, right? That big market crash, Black Monday. Now, every single seven-year cycle, you're getting this event, but the bottoming of the market tends to be exactly one year after the uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Hebrew New Year. Mm. So what I'm telling everyone right now is to pay attention to the month of September through November and specifically, you want to look at the eclipse that we're going to have in October. That eclipse should be when we start seeing um, the continuation to the downside for the stocks. And uh, this will not bode positive for the crypto market. I think that there's probably going to be a black swan at the fall time of this year, which could be a very positive moment for Ripple. Um Again, I'm sure you and I know you talk about it in your work often, and I think a lot of people who follow your work are aware that in order for XRP to become what it's meant to become, we need to have destabilization of the global financial system, and we need to have a lot of these shit coins go to zero. Um, at this moment, I know on CoinGecko, there's about 12,000 to 13,000 cryptocurrencies. On CoinMarketCap, there's 22,000 altcoins. 99% of them should go away. They're, it's mm -hmm. nonsense. Uh, just speculative gambling casino nonsense. Um, and I believe a lot of these ghost companies in, in, in the stock market tech stocks also deserve a similar outcome. And when those moves happen, it's very positive for the good actors in the space. It's very positive for the, for the ones that do have the connections with global financial system. And we know where things are headed with the, um, the, the let's just say we're all aware of where ripple fits into this you know i don't need to reiterate that because your community is well aware mm -hmm. so um i hope that answers your question and and i do urge people to not just take what i'm saying uh without going back in the charts and looking for yourself at the end of every seven year cycle one year later is when we typically typically get our lows and uh, that aligns perfectly with september through november and uh, the first five months of this year, though, are I think are going to be pretty awesome. Uh, not new all-time highs by any means, but I think they're going to be really positive, especially around March and April. Very good. Very good. So there you have it, guys. We're going to the moon. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But that's very important to note because a lot of people may not necessarily have been aware or know that. Um, something I'm very curious about as well is... Um, Let's see. So you say, how how is it that you can pinpoint and say that you think a September, November could be more positive for Ripple specifically? Is there something that you're looking at that that is pinpointing that that is a a, a positive time for Ripple and XRP, or is it just based on our analysis of what XRP is intended to be? Well, it has to do with the thesis of uh, Black Swan potentially around that okay. eclipse in October, and okay. I think I think XRP will initially get hit with everything else, but I think the overall oh. outcome will be the necessity. We need to see a shakeout for XRP to have that moment mm -hmm. where it catches back up. So I'm mm -hmm. not saying that we're going to watch the whole market go to shit and XRP is going to go up in a straight line by any means. What I'm yes, saying sir. is. The event that will be the catalyst that will lead to XRP becoming more at equilibrium and balanced uh, will be probably that time frame. And now if people want to know uh, my stance on XRP regarding new all-time highs and you know a positive conversation around XRP, it's going to take time. I, I think 2024 is a really solid year for XRP regarding the esoterica. Like if I was mm -hmm. to talk about the gematria, numerology, astrology connections, um, but that that's a long uh confusing conversation for most people. Really, all I want to say is that if there's going to be an event that takes place that it sets the stage for XRP to, to shine, it's mm -hmm. probably at the end of this year. Excellent. Excellent. I, I hope that cleared up. I, I hope that answered your question. Most definitely, brother. Most definitely. Um, something I'll ask as well is, so we have that um, around a year after the Shemitah, that's when the typical bottom should be. Um, For the stock market. 
yeah. yeah, yeah, for the stock market. And we have that potentially um, the next couple months should be relatively positive for the crypto market. And it's beginning to look more and more like we're breaking through a lot of resistance. We're seeing some positive action, things like that. Um, are there any any tokens you're particularly more fond of than others during these times? Or is it just, you know, the typical Bitcoin, Ether, XRP, maybe something like that? Yeah, correct. And the big reason why actually is because if I look back at the prior cycle, which I know mm -hmm. you you said before that you've lived through, if you mm -hmm. take from from the bottom that happened at, at the end of that crash. So if I just to give people a part that they could look out for, it would be December 2018, where we watched Bitcoin hit $3,000 after being almost 20,000. If you take mm -hmm. from that moment to the relief rally that came into June of 2019, we saw Bitcoin recover just as much as ETH. So it was not necessarily more advantageous to be in alts. So this mm -hmm. is an important thing for people to realize because I've been trying to tell people that in this stage of the cycle to anticipate Bitcoin dominance to hit 43 to 45% really quickly. And it actually it hit 43 today. So that's so far that's that condition has been met. Now, as we recover through this relief rally, which I've been telling you, I, I see ending probably by by May, you know, moving up into April uh, specifically. That's not going to be like this ultra positive alt rally. Like it might go up depending on how butchered and battered, you know, a particular alt is. Like if something lost 98% of its value, it might go up 600 or 700% from its wick lows. But mm -hmm. Bitcoin is pretty much going to be ruling the market now for until the next halving. So, mm. I know that that can confuse some people, especially in your audience that are focused on XRP. So do not forget what I told people about XRP on your last question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like XRP is isolated from the conversation as of now. And mm -hmm. I will stick by what I said before. The event that happens at the end of this year will lead to an isolated um, opportunity for XRP. But it's hard, you know, to answer these questions. You ask what tokens am I looking at? I just rather play the Bitcoin ETH XRP game right now instead okay. of getting into spec speculative shit, because mm -hmm. we know that the speculative shit only does well when Bitcoin gets an all time high. So mm -hmm. it, it's almost a requirement for Bitcoin to enter price discovery for us to see these speculative altcoins go up 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 percent. And mm -hmm. every time Bitcoin has a bigger correction, we see those same altcoins lose 95 to 98 percent of their value and thus far that's uh nobody could argue that no that's nothing but the truth my friend so i really appreciate you saying that and um, i think it's simple right it's nice to be simple at this stage for people who've gone through the so-called bear market and you've made it this far what's the point of complicating your portfolio by having 10 20 different positions you know just hold be more be be more like eloquent about the matter there's no point of getting complex, especially with the conditions of exchanges right now. I don't mm. trust exchanges right now. So if you're going to have 15 different positions on five different exchanges and some shit on your hardware wallet, you're just complicating stuff. Like play mm -hmm. simple right now. This is a really good time to keep it simple. Getting complicated with all these different coins is just going to make your life more difficult if and when we get a relief rally. And trust me, mm -hmm. when we get this relief rally, I can almost guarantee you there's going to be a lot of channels out there. I'm not going to say any names out of respect, but they're going to throw out a narrative that we're going to keep going up. They're going to be talking about this is the time where we're recovering from the, bull. you know, we're going to go on to 100K Bitcoin. And I don't mm -hmm. see that happening for a while. All right. So I'm just preparing people that like there's going to be new narratives as there always is because the market maker needs to shove out stories and, you know, all of they're going to have all of their celebrities coming out telling you to buy the top pretty much on that so called relief rally that I'm exposing. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Uh, if I were to go to another question, I'd ask what. What would you expect Bitcoin to kind of reach during this relief rally based on some some analysis that you've made? Yeah, so I should I I assume 32 to 33,000 should be the the minimum. We should at least get back into like 30 33,000, but if we were to compare the relief rally of the past two cycles, we should be um seeing about 44,000 
around the 40s to let's just say 30 to 50. I know that's a huge range, but 40 should be should be hit on this relief rally and a minimum mm-hmm. of 33 minimum. You know, what's so frustrating about hearing what you just said is because these are numbers and things that I had in my mind, right, all throughout 2022 <laughs> that I was like, you know, like these like this Bitcoin retracement needs to come. And if it does come around 35 to 45 K seems most reasonable because that's what, and and then I'm over here listening to you say these things. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds spot on. I wish I would have called that 95% crash for alts first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you, you live and you learn and, and you grow and you. Yeah. And the numbers. Things. <laughs> numbers that i just shared they're very technical too like if you just pull a fibonacci retracement tool from the current all-time high at sixty nine thousand to the current low which is at this time fifteen thousand five hundred fifteen thousand six hundred you're seeing the 0.5 fibonacci around thirty three thousand. and if we're gonna hit there and then roll over then that's just a dead cat bounce scenario and that's definitely possible for another leg lower but um when we look at those prior cycles like i just said before there's a couple of things at play like I don't really give a whole lot of my energy to stock to flow model anymore, but Mm -hmm. there is, there is a proof of the repeatability of at least hitting into the stock to flow line, which Mm -hmm. it's done every cycle. So nobody can disregard that again, proof. Um, But with that idea of hitting into like the golden pocket, which is just a technical play that we, we see on so-called relief rallies, Mm -hmm. this takes us in, this could take us into like the mid forties, mid 40,000 range. And uh, that could be a $1 XRP, you know, that could be a $1 10 XRP or something like that. So that would be a really gorgeous time to do a little bit of de-risking for anyone who's been in this market for a while and hasn't taken advantage. Um, Again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving financial advice. I know what I'll be doing when that time comes. But I, as a person of influence in this market, and I have access to so many people, I'm well aware that few took action on that. Uh, move that the market did in 2021 into 2022. Not nearly as many people um, because they waited too long. Yeah. Hey, myself included. Did I did I take quite a bit of profits from some alts that really made some life-changing ga- gains? You better believe it. But did I take the amount of profits I should have had I known some of the things I know now? Absolutely not. So this, if nothing else to everyone in the audience, this interview should act as a lot of grounding and a lot of um, personal responsibility taking, right? Because at the end of the day, something I teach my clients is have a plan to balance your crypto portfolio and what you believe these targets could be in the future, but also your personal life. Because what are you going to do in the meantime, while you're hoping for these hypothetical numbers to be reached, right? Are you going to be starting new businesses with the capital that you've earned from these profits from crypto, or are you just going to be waiting for the numbers to reach the screen for four years and crying about it? Right. So it's very important that people have that balanced perspective. So that's very powerful. Um, Something I did want to ask you that I think is very important is um, recently we saw a bit of a de-pegging between the crypto market and the stock market. Over the past few years, we've seen that the crypto market, specifically Bitcoin, had followed stocks almost in lockstep, right? Mm -hmm. My question to you is, since we now have these new uh, indications that there could be a deep pegging of stocks with crypto, is that something that you're paying attention to? Well, the number one thing we have to consider is the fact that we just went through a Shemitah. And another thing Mm -hmm. exoterically that we just went through was the Federal Reserve printing in one single year the entire supply of money since their inception back in 1913. Then we had the Black Swan event of the global shutdown for almost a year and a half, two years. That's unheard of, uh, especially with today's population, today's ability to communicate, et cetera. So we're talking like it's just such a wild time. Mm -hmm. You you have to really zoom out and look at everything across the board. When we talk about de-pegging or any of that, 
you know, we're looking at Bitcoin as a 13, 14 years of trading history. And a lot of these altcoins barely have a four year cycle under their belt. Mm -hmm. So yeah. where we really just don't have enough data here. And me as a professional technical analyst, I stop myself quite a bit and tell my audience, you know, when we're working with these charts, uh, we don't have a lot to, to work with. And did, have we ever even been correlated with this with the stock market? I mean, we saw isolated cycles before and crypto is moving much quicker. So one thing I will say, brother, is the the thing that might make it appear like it's depegged at this time uh, to put things into context. We just watched a trillion dollars leave this sector. We just watched 95 to 98 percent losses yeah. in a lot of these coins. Some of them were the top market cap coins. Like what was Terra Luna ranked before it went to pretty much zero, right? Okay. So yeah. This is so important to consider. We watched a majority of the of the liquidity leave this market already faster because it goes in quicker. We have faster runs. It's more volatile. It's like, look at the tech stocks in comparison to what the market behaved like before them back in 1999 and, and earlier. It, when we introduced tech stocks to the conversation, it just sped shit up. And now we have crypto and it's way faster. And when we look at the cycle of 2015 with crypto, we didn't have people walking around with iPhones who could buy Bitcoin at their local grocery store while they're shopping for food. Like mm. now you can literally buy crypto on your iPhone in the middle of the night. Like it's it's just so convenient. You feel me? Mm. So we have that convenience now to get and and he, he, this is important for people to really pay attention to what I'm saying. Convenience in a nascent asset class is not good. Because that means the the stupidest players in the game get involved and the the it's not balanced anymore, you know? So if we were to watch, uh, let's just say all of these altcoins go to zero and you're only left with maybe 200 projects, well, it'll be way less gains, but it'll also be way less losses. It'll become a mu much more sophisticated market. And mm -hmm. it kind of like we have to, it, it's this, uh, it's double-edged sword conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So if people want to play the safe game and look at the market from just you put some money in and you wait and it's going to go up over time, well, then the stock market would be a better uh, bet. You could just put your money in the S&P and that's proven itself over 100 years. But when it comes to crypto and the idea of the deep coupling and, and et cetera, we just don't really have enough data. And we're in such a confusing financial and global economic time that it would be um, unfair to make statements saying saying such things. So I hope that gives a holistic approach to the concept. No, that's powerful. That's that's about as grounded as as you could get. Um, let me see. I think something I'll ask is because of um, the point you made about November to or September to November being a more negative time mm -hmm. potentially in twenty twenty three is. Um, if that scenario were to play out, what would be probably the bottom for things like Bitcoin and Ether and and even the stock market as well? I mean, all these things, they're they're important to note because I've I've heard numerous people that I respect say, hey, we got to We got to go down 70 percent in the S&P. We got to go 70 percent down in the Dow. Right. So I'm curious to see your take and, and how low things can go. And, and what's to kind of add to that potential time frame for what you're calling for. I heard a recent interview of Ray Dalio saying this year, September is going to be a very, very negative time that he predicts for for the stock market as well. So. Yeah, well, it's probably because he knows about the Shemitah and the importance <laughs> of the Hebrew calendar. I mean, he knows yeah. they know they just don't say it, you know, because yeah. it would break their script. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, September is exactly one year away from the end of the Shemitah, which I already talked about earlier, yeah. and that's when I'm anticipating this all to happen. But I'll I'll clarify some things. For one, if Bitcoin wants to move up right now um, and get to something like 45 or 50K even, then I do anticipate the current bottom that's in to be the bottom for Bitcoin. Now, if Bitcoin was to reverse out of 45 to 50K and come back down to support somewhere around where it's trading today, like 21, maybe 23,000 in that bandwidth, we can see alts take another leg lower. 
So I just said about September through November, specifically for the stock market, and because the energy is pretty similar, um, that could bring that will bring down the cryptos. But I don't think it'll bring it down as much because we already saw ninety eight percent losses in a lot of these coins. So mm. think about this, right? The crypto crashes faster, and stock market crashes slower, right? Yeah. It's like arduous and slow crash, while crypto is just like straight line when you look at like a linear chart if you were to pull up any linear chart and just look at what we're dealing with it all looks like a blow off top you know mm -hmm. but when we look at it on a logarithmic scale it, it smoothens things out and makes it a little less uh it makes your stomach hurt less yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah. when you look at the when you look at the stock market it just has so much more support so much more market cap there's a it's a it's a def it's a different conversation so I am looking to September through November to be the lows for the stock market, but it could very well be over for Bitcoin and like the top 20 market cap uh, projects. And and one last thing I'll say is stable coins is a big part of this conversation too. There's mm, a lot yeah. of stables out there that need to be deployed. And when you take into account that we have 10 to 20,000 shit coins in this market that probably should go away. And then sitting in like the top 10 market cap is three stable coins. I mean, something's got to give, man. Like there's going to be a flush and uh, those stable coins are going to be deployed. So we have to yeah. see how it's going to we have to see how it's going to roll because I, I think we'll have more clarity on uh, some of the things we touched on today in this interview, probably by like March, April and getting into May. It's a historic time frame that we, we typically see the market roll over. You know, these guys, these head honchos at Wall Street, they're, it's May. They're like, we got to get our polish up our golf clubs and go to Miami. They don't give a fuck about the market. So they sell off and they want to just hang out and smoke their cigars. And that's that's what they do. Um, mm -hmm. But they're not interested in crypto right now the same way that they were back when, you know, we didn't have the same level of hurt in the uh, economic conversation. Right mm -hmm. now we have all these unemployment, we have all the unemployment, we have the layoffs. Retail is just getting smashed, right? And any yeah. retail that doesn't that didn't prepare themselves with at least gig work or creating their own business, if they weren't entrepreneurially minded, um, they're slayed and it's gonna be a hard rest of the year for them, you know. And I think what I've just said should be a motivator for people, you know, it shouldn't depress people who don't have their own business or don't have cash flow. It should motivate you, man, to be better, like to be the best self during this time because you need to prepare yourself regardless of what's going on in the world and what's going on in uh, global finances. You just got to prepare. Think, you got to take care of yourself. And I think that's what's so important and what a lot of entrepreneurs try and tell people, like some of the more famous ones, like it's going to be brutal for people who aren't of that mindset. And absolutely it will. We see the layoffs. We see the recession. We see the inflation. I can't even buy eggs without shedding a tear a little bit, my friend. It's getting hard out here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, while well, I'm kidding a little bit, it's very true. This is the time where professional solu solutionists can make their reputation into the future, right? And if you can can build solutions to problems or offer products or services that people need, right, that's going to be change your life forever. Let's put crypto aside. Like, what are you doing outside of your life to ensure that you're positioned correctly to protect yourself from whatever comes? You know, so that's a great point. Yeah, my friend. it's it's so important. I think so few were prepared with getting themselves in position for when these times happen. And if you look back at, you know, whoever survives through these moments, the, those are the ones that are putting in the work to be self-reliant. And the mm -hmm. man who's left like with nothing during these times is the one who is reliant. You are either reliant on your government. You are reliant on your television. You are reliant on influencers don't be that person like become the main character in your movie yeah yeah i couldn't say it any better myself um hmm, let's see so i guess something i'll ask of you is do you have any um charts available in the background that i could refer to or that you could put on the screen to kind of be able to use as a reference for people watching so that's something you could pull up by any chance yeah, actually, um, let me just quickly because I wasn't I wasn't anticipating you to get into that. There's two things that I could go over. Um, just give me sure. one second while I pull it up. 
Sure. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll take some time out to answer some questions from the audience. You see here, uh, let's see, let's see. I started with BCB and Yubo, and you led to Waters Above. Da -na -na. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Jansen. I appreciate it, my friend. Let's see, Griffin. Oh, so Griffin asks you about the SEC case. Like, what, what are your thoughts <laughs> on that, when it could end, and things like that? Yeah, that's a really popular question. And like, it's motivating me to actually just do a decode on it, <laughs> to be honest. Because, if you go on YouTube and be like, decode reveals when XRP case could end, you'll get a million views right there. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I really don't know actually, because this decoding thing is a lot for people. You know, it's mm. not popular and it, it shakes yeah. some, it shakes some people. Well, like, yeah. You know, the craziest thing when I'm doing my when I'm doing Gamatria is if I type out securities and exchange commission, mm. um, uh, I get 343, which is seven times seven times seven. So mm -hmm. 343 is a really powerful number. Like, you know, that game Halo, I think yeah. it was like, what was it? 343 studios like so anything with those sevens is massive. And when I'm like, as I'm decoding SEC, it equals 27. That's a match to Ripple. So I talked about this actually on a Coach JV uh, podcast that he did with me. I know you're, I know you're um, cool with JV and the Three T Warrior Academy. I did mm -hmm. a very thorough breakdown of like it's obvious that Ripple and the SEC were tied together in this format, and it happened during the Shemitah uh, time frame. Mm -hmm. Anywho, um, the idea of when this SEC debacle could be over. As I said earlier, I'm looking for that September through November time frame. That would not surprise me if before the end of 2023, we get like real clarity. Like I'm not just talking about people passing along documents on tweets. I'm talking about like some real deal shit coming directly from your government. Um, mm. So, but it's specifically the 2024 year that I have all my big connections with, with Ripple. Like X is the 24th letter in the alphabet. Um, mm. We have a very powerful eclipse that's happening for the United States of America in April of 2024. Ripple is a company of the United States of America. It's tied to Washington, D.C. So this is important when we look at the astrology connections to this company. Um, anywho, I, I would I would probably say that if there's going to be something to look towards um, the end of this year or in the first half of 2024 it should be cleared by 2025 i don't see it going further than that <laughs> cleared by 20 hey listen if this sec case isn't done by yesterday i'm gonna throw a fit my friend well don't, i mean don't, don't tell me about 2025 <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> well, brother, like, you know, I want to yeah. I want to talk about this real quick because I think we could have a little fun. Um, yeah, yeah. I just watched the Bernie, the Bernie Madoff documentary on Netflix. Mm, yeah. did, I, did you watch that? I have to get to it. It's on my you list. Have you have to. You have. No, it's so important, bro, because if you're like deep into Ripple and specifically yeah. talking about the SEC connection, you'll see how that was the biggest ball they dropped of all time with yeah. with Bernie Madoff. Yeah. They let this dude perpetuate what he did for decades. So mm. if people think that this this case needs to be expedited, dude, the government is like the the slowest slug that exists. Mm -hmm. So let's just be real here. You know, like our this government is known to push shit way too long. And I'm not trying to discourage people because I'll even say this, okay? And I'll you I'll be on record saying this. Even if this case took till 2026. I would still anticipate Bitcoin going into price discovery by 2024 would initiate XRP going into price discovery at the same time. It mm. will not matter what the fuck the SEC does, okay? Because yeah. during the SEC uh, investigation, all that you know nonsense, we still watched XRP go to almost two bucks mm -hmm. during it, okay? So let's just be like real here. Regardless of the time frame, you need to take action on developing an exit plan for this token and don't have it be some ridiculous upside target that makes no sense besides, you know, uh, you having fun with a Simpsons episode. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like people yeah. need to be real here. So is there potential for $5, $6, $7 plus XRP, even while the SEC thing is going on? Yes. Easy. Okay. 
So if the if that was to be cleared though, I would I'm just going to be mature and say that it would be more likely the end of this year into 2024. I don't see it going on past 2025, but after watching that Bernie Madoff thing, it showed me that these cases can really get stretched out for a long time. Mm-hmm. Why would the government need to expedite this particular case? They have no reason to. There's so much other shit they're worried about, right? Like we have to admit that. That was why they kept holding off on the investigation of Bernie Madoff, because there were just bigger fish to fry. There was more important shit going on. There was the war on terror, right? That's what they called it. (laughs) It took until the housing crisis for them to finally get some dirt on this guy. And he Mm. was operating at a net loss for almost like 15 to 20 years. Mm. Nope. So it's proof. It's not just speculation. And I think a lot of the time, like we want something to unfold the way we want it to. And we create this mechanism of hope or we get discouraged. And I'm here to give you like the real, but also say that, you know, don't get discouraged because regardless of how long this case takes, if Bitcoin breaks into price discovery, I still see XRP um, hitting into those $3 plus targets into 2024, 2025. Very nice. Thank you for that, brother. See and to to you, Griffin. I guess that answers your question, my friend. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Someone asked me, "What is my favorite fruit?" <laughs> what a question, dude! <laughs> Come on, <laughs> my favorite fruit, uh, strawberries. Let's go with it. Let's see. So, in says several astrologers and investors advise to wait for the January February twenty twenty three market dip before investing, but if the bottom has already passed with FTX. What is the recommendation for entering the market this year? I've watched red pill videos where the dates, the Demetrius system are thoroughly analyzed, but it is difficult for me to understand in which direction the energy of the market is moving based on the numbers, whether it's an important day the market falls, how to make this information understandable to me so so that it's usable in practice. Yeah, so if you want, I could share my screen and I could kind of try to answer that question for, for people um oh, perfect you you just have to allow me access to and then i will you know what maybe i don't want to no I'm kidding I'm kidding <laughs> okay let me know if you can see my screen pop up excellent okay so what we have going on here is a macro bitcoin analysis it's a one week chart and I believe this is very, very clean because there's no wicks. This is just the candle body closes, but it's a line chart. So it's nice and clean. It gives you a good view of what's been going on over the past, you know, almost five years now. So here we have the 20, uh, 2017 cycle top. Here we have the first touch point at the bottom of this trend line going into the so-called bear market of 2018, 20, uh, uh, sorry, 2018, excuse me. Then we see a retouch back on this trend line around the C19 event. And then recently we've touched back on it just as of, you know, earlier this month. Now, what we need to consider with this Bitcoin analysis is that we are getting very close to this other trend line that I'm uh, showing up here, which would just be a resistance trend line. So down here we have our macro support. Up here we have our macro resistance. Now, this trend line actually is pretty much in alignment with, I'm going to quickly show you like with candles to make this a little bit easier for people to see. This again, a weekly chart. These are on the candle body closes. You're seeing all time high, secondary rejection into the bigger pullback. And then recently, just as of a couple of days ago and today, we've started to, you know, reject off of this. The apex of this pattern comes in around late March. We are so close to this breakout and more likely a bullish breakout that that's what's making me um, feel that this low that we got here for Bitcoin specifically is the bottom for Bitcoin. We have a relief rally that's most likely underway. And then after this relief rally, it would be more than likely to continue holding this macro trend line. And that does not mean that the altcoins can't go lower because if Bitcoin was to get up to the 42, 44,000 range and keel over, come back to this trend line, it could close, it could have wicks below it because it's a crypto, it's very volatile, but then we could still get bought back up at the end of the week to the same, to same levels. So if we analyze where this trend line is around the end of the year, somewhere between October through November, it's sitting around 22 to 24,000. That would be structurally in a a perfect pullback. Um, Let me pull a Fibonacci real quick to show people what's up. So 
I'm just pulling from that swing high to swing low. And you'd see right over here, this might be a little hard for people. You see this two, three, six. That is a the key level to return back to after a relief rally. The two, three, six is typically retested after you get into this zone right here called the golden pocket. So it looks something like this, just to be really, really clear, really thorough. Let's just say we come back down to here short term and then we pop into April, May come back into this zone right here, and then somewhat of a retest here into the end of the year. Now, if Bitcoin does this, this could not be so positive for everything else because we have to consider Bitcoin's going to have a shit ton of dominance around this stage of the cycle. When it pulls back, it's probably going to steal a lot of that uh, liquidity. A lot of these speculative altcoins are going to flood back into Satoshi's. That's a typical thing that happened even back here in this cycle and the prior cycle. This chart doesn't show it, but it but it happened. And anyone could go back and just look this up for themselves. So I really like this macro trend line because it's clean. Again, you had this black swan event. We had a wix lower than the trend line, but it still got bought back up on the weekly closes. So very clean. I think I gave a, a clean answer, not too complicated. Kind of gives you an idea of uh, how I'm perceiving things to go. This pullback could be very bearish for things like XRP, IOTA, et cetera. You name the altcoins, they mm -hmm. can actually, they could actually what we would call just double bottom. So I'll give one last example and then we'll move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, let's look at like H bar. Okay. H bar right into the end of the year. Now we have a little bit of a a little bit of a recovery. Let me show you same fib concept. I'm gonna put here into the October, November timeframe right there. That would be our zone to return back to. We could have our relief rally, short-term pullback, and then relief rally into maybe 0.5 FIB, something like this. Make a lot of sense, rejecting off of this prior retest. Come back down, boom, double bottom. And then you have, you just regain structure, okay? Now, the reason I'm showing this chart as a double bottom is because we've had a 98% or sorry, look at that 94% correction from top to bottom. That's mm. ridiculous, especially on a coin that has utility, a, a solid project, if you will. Um, so expect on this move right here, um, things like Binance, that might be the time where Binance finally breaks structure. Look at the Binance chart. It's um, amazing looking. Something's got to give. It can't just keep maintaining this uh, this chart forever. There's going to eventually be some sort of a shakeout on this project. Mm -hmm. You know, this is kind of my way of analyzing things one thing at a time. And for that person that said that they're aware of my red pill podcasts. So that means that they're watching my exclusive content. And I usually am very thorough on, on these um, scenarios. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I Thank hope, you. I hope that, uh, I hope that helped. Uh, and was there any questions that you had specifically about me sharing the charts? Cause you asked me to bring it up before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sure. So um, specifically for XRP, I'm curious to see what you see it reaching. Like if we have this upper, this upper, um, let's see this this little bull run in March and maybe even a catalyst for 2024. Like what what yeah. could it reach based on this analysis in in the next year or so? For sure. So I actually think there's a potential for a double cycle for XRP on the next move, meaning we can have something like what happened back here where it went on one cycle, then it consolidated for a little bit, a little bit of capitulation, and then it moved up again. This is actually an idea that I have. Uh, so it would be amazing actually for the SEC case to get prolonged because if we were to have a move like this, get into the 1618, somewhere around like 26 bucks, which would be fucking ridiculous. And then to have it capitulate, just kind of hold. Um, and this looks like nothing, but let me just measure and show you. That was a 70%. That was a 70% pullback. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's a really key uh, structure to consider. And this is not normal price action. Uh, that's why, you know, I, I'm considering it as a possibility because of how, um, I guess the word would be suppressed, how yes. suppressed XRP is. Now, if we look at this structure right here, I just want to show you guys based on Wyckoff method. I don't know if your uh, audience is aware, but I personally like to use Wyckoff method for my charting. It's very effective. Richard Wyckoff, mm -hmm. 
I think he passed away over a hundred years ago and I've still yeah. been using his, his analysis to this day. It works amazing on the crypto market. You can see mm -hmm. right here is a buying climax. After this buying climax, you have a selling climax. Then you have what's called an automatic rally. So just going to zoom in. This is your, or sorry, to this current cycle. This is your buying climax. This is your selling climax. And right here in April of 2021, when it almost hit two bucks is the automatic rally. So here we are, we're in this phase right here, the final moments. And if you, if I try to kind of zoom out a little bit, obviously this is going to be an extended cycle because there's way more market cap. There's mm -hmm. way more cryptos to distribute uh, into, but this structure right here is sort of where I see us in. And then that's going to be whenever we have price discovery, it's probably going to be into 2024. And those targets would be initially like slightly below $10 into $14. Mm -hmm. And then there's a possibility for it to stagger out a little bit and then shoot up uh, one last time. Now that would probably be into the end of 24 into 2025. As for price targets though, like we're really playing with a wild card here because this coin is so fucking suppressed and um, it really actually depends on how much gets washed out of the market. If we were to see a lot of a big washout in the shit coin market, yeah. then I think XRP yes. is going to be, I think XRP is going to hit at minimum 20 to $27 minimum. That makes a lot of sense, my friend. But on the on the first leg up, I will kind of give more of my attention to somewhere around uh seven, eight, and then into this level right here. Hmm. Somewhere, somewhere into this uh sorry, wait one second. I want to change this because this is going to confuse people. Excuse me, just one second, guys. So now I actually changed my settings on this fib tool. I have it set in linear and it's going to show you a little bit of a different picture, which is this four, two, three, six. And I don't know um, how much you're aware of technical analysis, but this yeah, is maybe. really simple to use. Yeah. So this four, two, three, six sitting around 13, 14 bucks to me, that makes a ton of sense on our first like knee jerk reaction to the upside. And that would be very overheated. We'd want to look at things like weekly RSI. We'd want to look at, you know, some of these macro um indicators because if it's going to go straight to 14 you you probably want to start your de-risking anything above that 1618 yeah oh, let's see so let's see something something somebody asked as well is can you ask him about the year of the rabbit situation follow the white rabbit down the rabbit hole good or bad for crypto <laughs> i don't know what that means but i hope you do <laughs> yeah so i actually released a decode on this in my patreon it was called year of the rabbit decoded and uh, we are going to be moving into the chinese lunar new year of the rabbit in like four days it starts on january 22nd and this is really important symbolism because The Economist released a magazine back in 2021, right around the start of the Shemitah, and it was called Down the Rabbit Hole. And it was showing, um, and you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but The Economist is sort of like predictive programming. They just yeah. release stuff to the public and it's very, um, it's exactly. it's kind of it's kind of exoteric actually they're they're flexing on us like all of the economist magazine stuff is just a flex they're not even trying to hide shit anymore they just give it to you right straight um you don't even really need to spend too much time decoding it anywho uh we're moving into the year of the rabbit so it's made me reconsider that um that's going to play a significant role in in this year and when we get into the decode we have to consider that the rabbit is typically tied back to Venus or Aphrodite. We know that the rabbit is a symbolism of fertility and sex and desire. And we've heard that term uh, fucking like bunnies, right? <laughs> so yeah. that jokes aside, um, the rabbit is sometimes in, in a more esoteric sense connected back to Venus or Aphrodite. And the month of April is given to Aphrodite. And this is so important in my work because we have a very important eclipse happening in April and early May. And the one in early May is actually a return. So you've heard of like Saturn's return or, um, you know, I don't, I know this is a lot for most people. So I'm trying to stay simple. No, dude, here. dude. But hey, like, I could, I could go there. I could go there, bro. So okay. Okay. Like, I just, back. I just don't want to, okay. I don't want to uh, overwhelm. Uh, I'm trying me. to not overwhelm. Okay. Beautiful. So the eclipse that we're having in early, uh, 
May is a lunar eclipse and it'll be a return of Venus and the sun. So we have more Venus connections, more connections back to Aphrodite. This is telling me that April into May is going to be extremely bullish. And then maybe as early as the first couple weeks of May, we'll actually roll over and start a new downtrend, which will lead us into October, November, December. So I actually look at the rabbit as an extremely positive sign. Whilst last year, we were in the year of the tiger, and that was an extremely negative thing. And XRP, this is really important for XRP because tiger and in Gematria and XRP equal the same thing. And they're tied to the same thing, which is Jupiter. And I did a decode that I think was very revealing to the world back in, uh, I think it was January uh, of 2022. And it was the Super Bowl decoded. I decoded that Super Bowl between the Los Angeles Rams and the Bengals. And I told everyone that based on the numbers and based on the symbolism that I'm getting, the tiger is is a negative uh, energy. Anything tied to Jupiter, anything tied to the tiger is negative. And look at the whole year of 2022. It absolutely sucked in the market. Um, We saw 95, 98% losses in the alts. The Bengals lost. Um, And anything tied to the number 15, which XRP is, was suppressed. Uh, Hex, for instance, is a coin that has the 15 in Gematria. It got shattered, even with all the positive narratives that were coming out from the Hex community. No offense to them, but reality is more important than your hope. So... That is so critical to consider that the Chinese New Year does absolutely play a role in market behavior. Mm. Okay, now this is this is whew, this is going to be the most loaded question I'd probably ask all day. Why? <laughs> Why is the tiger symbolic with negativity for for certain things, and why? Is the Chinese New Year necessarily important to to be following? Because I've heard that before. I've heard we should be following the Chinese New Year, but we should also be following the Hebrew calendar. And, and let me hey, let me tell you something about myself. I don't got time to be doing this. So <laughs> that's why I lean on someone like you that has the time to to analyze these things that aren't necessarily um, right in front of me all the time. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'll tell people why I was interested in the tiger. And it was because of a piece of advertising material that was getting passed around by Facebook when they converted to meta. Mm -hmm. And there was a commercial that they released right during the year of the bull, the year of the ox. Uh, Funny enough, we had a bull run in the year of the bull. So Mm -hmm. there's another piece of evidence. Uh, (laughs) Anyways, when we moved into the year of the tiger, that was right around that transition of when Metaverse released this um, advertisement footage. It was in a, uh, it looked like a museum and it was a portrait of a uh, tiger and a bull together. And this was exoteric. Everyone could have seen this. It was a, it was basically the advertisement for Metaverse. And they kind of did that by surprise, right? That conversion of their company, it, it, it was so random. And I was interested in how I could utilize this and the conversation around this like technocratic uh, movement that we're all like moving into like a black mirror episode, you know, ever since the, the pandemic, we're seeing that we f- we're all feeling that, right? Like it was clear that they pushed a lot of tech, this technocratic uh, energy yeah. into our lives and they leveraged on the the C scam to to get away with all of it. And if people don't agree with that, then that's fine, but you got to wake up, you know? So I was looking at this from a, a very introspective place. And then when the Bengals lost, I was like, fuck, this is something, you know? So the why is um, kind of, you know, it's a loaded response because it just depends on your belief. And I'm not here to convince people, you know, we just have the data. And I think that's more important. I I, I try to never convince. I try to just give a response back where people can utilize this and see the data themselves. So as opposed to looking at one calendrical system being more important than the others, I think that's a waste of energy. I think you need to consider all things. Just like brother, when you want to make a real estate investment, do you just look at the fucking parking garage? 
Of course, that's exactly what you should do. Of course not. Of course not. Right. <laughs> right. You're going to look at the, you're going to look at the property values. You're going to start looking at like, is there a nice school in this neighborhood or is, or, or is somebody shooting up heroin right next to the dumpster? You know, yeah. these sort of things matter when you're making big decisions. And when you make investment decisions, you take them, uh, you know, you gather all your data and you, you, uh, make your choice accordingly. So my response here is when I decode, I'm considering all things and I'm trying to minimize the the noise. I'm trying to minimize the minutia. And like you said before, you don't have time to do this. Well, I don't have time to be looking at the news or people's tweets or any of that. That's just like, I'm more interested and passionate about the decoding thing. And that's the beauty of us all coming together and collaborating is while you specialize in one thing, somebody specializes in another thing, I specialize in my thing. And then the the listener, the consumer can narrow down what they feel they could, re- what they resonate with most. And then they could extract from there and, and develop their own plan accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. I guess something else that I'll I'll kind of bounce off topic just slightly, just because I'm curious. Um, I'm sure that this gematria and 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 astrology can help predict um, future black swan events or world events, or or at the very least give the type of energy that we'll be um, exposed to to a certain way. Um, Twenty. 23 seems to be the year of AI, right? And a, and a lot of other technological advancements. Is there Correct. some way, shape, or form um, that you can predict when you believe central bank digital currencies are going to come fully online? And also, um, when this new or what this new type of event that could be catastrophic of the world could be? Like for example, they've the the World Economic Forum has hinted about cyber pandemics. There's also the potential mm. World War Three coming around. Hey, they, I've 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 seen things about comets and solar flares. I've seen it all, my friend. Let's narrow it down. What could this world event be that 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 causes a collapse of the system? And uh, when could this new financial system and CBDCs come online? Yeah, man. Lots to get into with that. Well, first and foremost, (laughs) there's already, it's already been piloted and it's already being done, you know? So it is the the question is when will it be done for the United States of America? Like what exactly? Or um, or more. So, so yeah, there's a lot of pilots um, and there are a lot of, you know, smaller countries that are online already, like Bahamas, they have the sand dollar already. But what I mean is more like, when will it be full blown? biggest economies in the planet like the pound and, and the euro and the u.s and yeah. things like that when would that when 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 could we expect something like that to really be happening you know what i think it's going to be the next shmita which gives us a time frame until like 2028 2029 i think that's how long it's going to take for like the united states of america to be ready for that type of change but one Thing I will say is that they can turn on CBD. They could turn on a digital bank, uh, or sorry, a central bank digital currency within a night, within a single night. But the problem yeah. is, is if they did that in America, you'd have the fucking purge. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can't be, do it in America. It's impossible. I would be part of that purge, my friend. That would be right. <laughs> right. So we're working with a different species here. Like people in China, they don't have guns. They're kind of just like, you know, they're programmed into like a zombie like state. No offense to them. I know a lot of them are awake, but when the majority is programmed in that way and indoctrinated so deeply to having no sense of sovereignty, well, their government has been practicing this way of reality also for centuries. It's easy to implement this stuff. They have all the infrastructure ready, whilst the past two to three years has been you're watching America's infrastructure get laid out. I think that they went super hardcore in well with the pandemic. I think they went super hardcore in Australia and parts of Europe to see and Canada to see how they would react if they were to implement something like one of these CBDCs. So remember what was going on in Australia was the most intense lockdowns you could imagine. Uh, Canada went through a lot of stuff. They even had uh, that PSYOP with trucker rally and all that shit where people thought freedom was coming. Yeah, that's and that's very important for people to note, right? It's like 
the reason I bring this th these things up are because we're seeing a lot of controversial figures get their bank accounts frozen, right? A lot right. of people like the truckers in Canada, they got their accounts right. frozen. So, so they're already right. trialing all these all these CBDC like account freezing programmable money like things. And right. they're getting people used to that concept and, and wanting to accept it for people on that you may consider to be on extremes, but then that'll trickle in to someone who maybe just wants to have a nice steak a little too often, right? Maybe you want to take a flight to the Bahamas one too many times, right? That's, right. that's coming my friend. And it's, it's they're awful. showing they're showing that they can shut down the bank account of a pretty much broke uh, truck driver, and they can also shut down the bank of bank account of a multi billion dollar Kanye West. Yep, amen. And they don't give a single fuck. They don't. They can show they they show you that they could parade around their favorite influencer of the year, Andrew Tate, and then they could so called arrest him and take away his thirty three cars. Yeah. They're showing you that you don't really have, and that's funny, right? Isn't that ironic? Because that same guy was talking about how, you know, your liberty gets taken away with the mask and this, that, and the third, but we just watched all of his assets get seized. Mm. So it's it's just amazing. Like they play their role. These are paid actors. And I want people to realize that, you know, what's going on with the government. They're all paid actors. They're like, it's like world wrestling, uh, you know, entertainment. It's literally like watching Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage. That's what's going on in the world stage. So when you see these big events break out and it sounds like it's going well for the for the public, for the for, for society, just know that it is a operation that is being done to test human behavior because that's how they gather that data. And they, they could use Twitter for this. What do you think that is? Twitter's just gathering all that data, TikTok, it's the same. It's in all of their terms and conditions. All they really want out of you is to know your behavioral response to when they want to do what they want to do. It's like chess, okay? And the best chess players are so far ahead of you, it would boggle your mind. Like it would be incomprehensible to understand what's going on in yeah, their yeah. blueprint, okay? So we've been given a lot of their blueprint and they've already shown us over the past couple of years what they could do and what they want to do. You know, I think the World Economic Forum has been very candid about their plans. Now, where will it happen uh, and what sequence will it happen? Well, it's already started, as we talked about earlier. And when will it start to un unfold in places like the UK, Canada, most of Europe, uh, as well as United States, maybe Mexico? It's going to take more time. It's just going to take more time. I don't think those places, especially the United States, are going to be hit uh, as hard with these draconian technocratic decisions by the central banking system and the Federal Reserve System. One other thing I'll say is the world reserve currency being the US dollar, I don't see that going anywhere or, or being threatened at least until the next Shemitah. Now, I know that goes against a lot of people like what Ray Dalio believes and all that other shit, but um, at the same time where those same popul uh, popular figures were talking about the DXY crashing, I was talking about expecting it to go deflationary. So look at what it did it, it yeah. during the whole Shemitah year. It went up in a straight line. The reason yeah. that happens is because the Shemitah is not a positive time frame for the markets, you know? So these guys, like, they're just talking heads. And I don't trust, you know, them with my investment thesis. I uh just want to preface with that and I'll I'll move on to your next question. Um, because I think it's important that whenever we hear these same individuals come out and say that there's going to be a dollar collapse and gold is going to $10,000 and China is going to take over the world in a world war, this is all just to gather energy from you. It's to get you reactionary. It's to get you scared. It's to get you to do stupid shit. And you need to be able to see through it all, you know, because they're just paid actors at the end of the day. So I would say to people, um, you know, it's hard to give advice on how to respond to this, but it's pretty obvious that they play their cards accordingly. And there's certain places they just can't get away with uh, implementing these draconian tactics. It's going to take them a lot longer. Hmm. Now that's very powerful, my friend. You got you went in on that one. That's for damn sure. Now that's powerful. Let me think. Hmm. So specifically on the point that you made about the dollar um fundamentally speaking i think all fiat currencies are scams i think some 
of, of the scam fiat currencies are propped up better than others. The US dollar being a good example of that, the one being another good example of that relative to something like the Argentine peso or the lira. Um, mm -hmm. My question to you is, when do you think, um, I, let me phrase it this way. I believe that ultimately the central banks need to keep inflating these currencies into oblivion right that's ultimately the end game when do you think we can see a time for the fed to begin pivoting and starting quantitative easing again mm. well you know everything kind of works in this chaos followed by response you know hegelian dialectic problem solution yeah. I, I think that that's their that's their main play typically and they just keep it in cycles so we already went through that one cycle. Like, I mean, honestly, if we just pay attention to the cyclicality of these big changes in global events, it's on that seven-year cycle. So I think we just need to kind of consider at this time that as we make it through 2023, this is pretty much the finality of negative energy. I think 2024 into 2025 is going to be much more prosperous. So if mm. that's if we're kind of taking the idea that the QE is a positive thing for markets... Is that something we could agree on? <laughs> like, well, unfortunately, right? Like, I think that's yeah, I know it happens. sounds ridiculous, right? Know, but it's like if that's how we're gonna play that one, then yes, I mean, I think that 2024 would be very sensible. Uh, probably after that eclipse uh, in April 2024. 20, uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that we're actually out of all of the negativity. And I, I said this a while ago. I used prediction analysis to determine when the the c19 thing would be over and when global travel would be back to somewhat normal for the majority of the countries and we actually i nailed that one um and i don't like taking credit for these sorts of things but i think being able to predict that one was so much more important than like which, market uh behavior exactly what I've, i missed so that. what i was so my theory was that if we go back to spanish flu we could actually utilize the data from spanish flu to determine when the c19 thing would be over when we would be able to take the masks off stop the vac the v nonsense and get past all the travel restrictions and mm -hmm. if we look at the time frame of spanish flu it was two years and two months so I was telling people that I anticipate the same thing, which it started in March of 2020. And I was uh, at least six months, I, I believe one year in advance on a podcast that I did with a friend of mine that we would see by May of 2022, it's over. And that's exactly how it went. We saw, I believe, like maybe even two months before that, the UK, Boris Johnson came out and was like, it's all over, you know, no restrictions on businesses, none of that travels back to normal. We saw all of the Scandinavian countries. I mean, it was it was miraculous almost, you know, and now we're at this point here where uh, even Australia has reopened like U.S. still holds that one restriction with the V. But that's probably going to be ending around April, according to the TSA. Uh, but as of the traveling and free movement around the U.S. and the restrictions and all that, that's been gone for a while now. You know, it's pretty much back to pre C-19 uh, society. So mm -hmm. that that right there um, is really interesting because I, I have a lot of people coming to me that they want to know what's the big event. Like you just asked um, about the idea of cyber pandemics or like maybe another new breakout of a new virus strain. And I've told them the virus is over. It's done. It's You don't have to worry about that ever again. It is gonzo. They're not going to be able to use that card anymore because they know the current behavior of people and how they would respond to it. The people are done. They don't believe it anymore. OK, so that's always what they're doing is they're on a teeter totter of belief. And once it leans in the in the public's favor, they know that they need to move on to their next thing. Now, mm. the idea of being able to to like silence the Internet and use the Internet as a weapon, I think that would be one of the last things they would want to try doing like an Internet blackout, because if you really want to make people lose their fucking mind, take away their social media like you shut off the internet and you'll have a more intense purge scenario than if you took money out of people's bank accounts. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. I think people are absolutely addicted to this cheap dopamine that they could get off of social media. So if you absolutely. were to lock them out of that, 
I think you would cause serious withdrawals. I think the withdrawals that people would suffer from without a day of internet would be more intense than withdrawals from drugs like heroin. Um, and people would, if anyone wants to debate me, that's fine. But I, I think we have to consider that this is free, it's cheap, and it's legal to just be on TikTok all day. And kids as young as six years old are doing it. And I see grownups as old as 60 year old doing it. And they've been conditioned to like, that's the new way of communication. That's the new way of being entertained. That's uh, the cell phone is like an, a vital organ of a modern human being. If without it, leaving your house without it, humans feel naked. They feel like they're leaving their child at home. So I don't think they're going to play that card, brother. I think that would be like one of the last things that they would do because the cell phone and the internet and social media is a pacifier. It keeps you, it keeps you uh, enslaved in that mm -hmm. sense. Now it could be used as a tool. I believe this interview is one of the ways that we could convert a weapon into being a tool. And that's a beautiful thing. There's a lot that you could take away from this digital realm. There's a lot that you could leverage on. It's a blessing and a curse like all things, but it's about how you behave with it, how you connect with it. I just think the collective is so addicted to it. Like if there was a virus and a pandemic, the only one that I see is people's connection and relationship they have with their devices. That's a mm. serious pandemic. You know, what's unbelievable is that you took me in a place, you took me towards a convergence of Brave New World 1984, Fahrenheit 451, and every single, <laughs> every single one of these types of books <laughs> I've ever, I'm like, damn, you're absolutely right. Because it's one of those things where I know that, well, this is how I see it, frankly. They didn't just lock down the planet and, and they aren't prepping us for CBCs and shutting down some people's bank accounts for no reason like the yeah the, like they're encroaching on people's rights day by day step by step in new ways and prepping people's minds for what's to come my question is what would the style of event that comes what what would it be that that causes up to potentially lock down again because i don't think they're going to lock down the planet for two years and not try it again i think they will my question to you is, what would it be? Would it be climate? Because that's they're pushing that one a lot right now. What 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 do you think it could be based on what? It's going to be hyperinflation and food. Mm. Food is going to become, and I've been talking about this for a long, long, long time. Because when I started my channel and I would do my live streams and my weekly live streams, I don't really talk about crypto or finances too much. I talk about all this other uh, stuff that I feel is, you know, quite intriguing to get into. And uh, a thing that comes up a lot in more conscious or spiritual people is the the conversation behind food prepping, like being a prepper. And I'm not a prepper. I'm a, I'm. It's just not my state of being. You know, I'm more like nomadic. So I don't want to hoard a bunch of cans of nonsense. I just want to live my life on the go. And uh, that's me. You know, I'm more like a warrior in that way. But I've been telling people against their data that they want to show me and against their stories or narratives they want to share with me that we will never have a food shortage ever. What we're going to have is humans are going to be priced out of the foods that they used to like consuming. That's what's going to happen. And that's mm -hmm. not the same as a food shortage. Okay. So you're going to see regular, like common grocery store foods just go up parabolically in price. And that's what we've watched unfold over the past year. And the reason I was so adamant about it when I started my channel back in 2021 was because of my knowledge surrounding the Shemitah and how the Shemitah is a year that's practiced in Judaism around agriculture and just letting mm -hmm. the land be. And it has everything to do with finances as well. And that's how we started this interview. So I don't need to revisit that. My point now is how are they going to engineer crisis to humans? They're going to make your food expensive as fuck. Wow. So that's really what people need to be aware of. Like your food is everything. You need it to live. You don't need your car and you do not need your job. You no. need food. And, and I'm not telling people that being a prepper is wrong or it's a bad idea. I'm just letting people know that it's not my personal state of being. And I rather in that past two years, focus on building better business, better communications and connections with, with other people and focusing on my cash flow. Um, mm. And that way, when this time comes around, I'm prepared for that. Um, so I just think that that is really what I think will be the next event. It'll have to deal with food uh, being so food and energy, okay, which yeah. are part of the same conversation, right? Because if energy goes up, then it costs more money to 
put the food from the farm to the grocery store, right? Well, and, you have, and that makes a lot of sense because uh, who's who's currently? Uh, what are the two countries currently like facing this war right now? It's Russia, Ukraine. That's ground zero for what's going on, and and they make up, I believe, is a quarter of the world's wheat, right? That's food, and Russia is over here supplying energy to Europe, specifically Germany. Why why are prices for energy going parabolic over there? So yeah, so they've been shutting makes- down farms, trying to shut down farms in. Uh, in the Netherlands and Belgium, you know that China's buying up all the meat, all of it. Like they bought up all the grain. Uh, they've exhausted a lot of their, uh, you know, there's countries that used to rely on saying yes to doing deals with, you know, their agricultural products. They've started mm-hmm. saying no, like Australia's run out of rice. So I'm not here to debate. I'm not here to say that we're not having problems at that level. It's just, this is all part of the upper cl- upper class, the elite, and the people that made it through this whole chaos over the past two to three years, there's not going to be a food shortage. It's just only those individuals are going to be able to maintain the same lifestyle that they've had, and they're going to continue to thrive, whilst normal people are going to have to make some tough decisions. The populace, the collective, they're going to have to start making some tough decisions on, okay, I can't afford to eat these prepared meals anymore. I'm going to have to start buying like dried beans and rice and just basic stuff. So that's the thing that I think is going to be uh, the next big, big noticeable change. And if there is going to be a black swan, that's where it would be targeted, you know? And another thing that's not debatable at all is look at over the past two to three years, how many of these factories that deal with food and processing food have just exploded out of nowhere, caught on fire out of nowhere. Unbelievable. It's pretty wild, right? So, I mean, uh, yeah, they're definitely targeting that particular um, part of the conversation. And I think the virus idea is over. Um, Now, think about this, brother. If we do start to see this insane hyperinflation of food and people start making decisions like, well, I'm either going to eat today or I'm going to pay for gas to drive to my commute to work. That's Mm -hmm. a tough decision, but it's probably going to be the one they take eating food because you need that to live. So that's going to create civil unrest. And when you have civil unrest, that is the prime opportunity for something like a martial law scenario where then they could lock you down for that. So that, again, kind of plays into answering the question. If there's going to be another lockdown, it's probably going to be because of something like civil unrest. And the civil unrest will most likely be caused Mm -hmm. by the domino falling of hyperinflation and food. And that that makes a lot of sense, too, because with lockdowns and with hyperinflation and with the food supply chain and all these different things, the people that really get the short end of the stick will be the the people that are hovering around the poverty line, right? It's like, you, you, you do that and boom, it's starvation, right? The people that were hovering, that were just making it and boom, done. Done for, or, right? or increased crime because they're going to start to rob grocery exactly. stores. They're going to start exactly. to, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So and and the reason that's so important is because the eventual lead up to what I believe will be central bank digital currency adoption and and the eventual enslavement of man through that, I believe the way they're going to get people to adopt central bank digital currencies is through universal basic income, where then when AI comes in and automation comes in and takes people's jobs away on top of food being more expensive on top of energy being more expensive and all these things, the only thing that they'll be able to use in order to survive will be that government universal basic income because there's nothing else. It's it's that. (laughs) Jobs gone, food expensive, energy expensive. It's that or nothing, right? So I've always believed that that's how they're going to bring on the new system. And in a time of desperation for the public, um, they'll propose that as if they're saviors and it's interesting. I agree. I agree. It's part of the conversation. UBI is definitely something that I've considered. Um, and I know that they've piloted that. So when we talk about the conversation of CBDCs being piloted as well as UBI, I I think that it's going to work, um, probably not in America. So again, we're going to have that. It's kind of revisiting the same overall general idea of the place you're, that's the most. You're more sorry. bullish on America than I am, aren't you? Very until 2029. And then I become very, very bearish on America. 2030. 
And the reason why, brother, is because I'm looking at the cyclical nature of our reality. I see that 1929 with the Great Depression, I think that's going to be the cycle that we enter in 2029. Mm. Nothing is new under the sun. So I'm looking at this exo uh, esoterically where... I think that the next, uh, well, now it would be going on six more years is going to be great in the United States of America. Um, really? But while that's happening, we're going to see a lot of things start to kind of redistribute. We're going to see a lot of people move to places like Dubai. Uh, we're going to see a lot of that shit going on. We're going to see a lot of people start moving to places like uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And you're going to be like, why are they moving there? You know, so just pay attention to those red to those signals. Those are red flags. Oh, um, myself included. Hey, I'm making an exit plan as we speak. My clients notice because <laughs> there's there's one person that I follow that I heavily respect. He goes by the name of Nomad Capitalist. You may have heard of him. He always says, "Go where you're treated best, and you'd rather be a couple years too early than one second sure. too late." Right. So it's hundred percent. So something that, especially to those of us in here, they're very crypto and freedom minded and things like that. Having a diversification plan and internationalizing your lifestyle is going to be essential to just being able to survive just in case shit hits the fan. Because there's, yeah, I love, I love the States and, but I'm from New York City and I was in Me New too. York City during, oh, look at that. Wow. That's beautiful. So you understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're in Brooklyn. So during the oh, you would be from Brooklyn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? Oh, I'm not gonna answer that because that'll tell. Too okay, much. okay, I feel, but, I feel, I feel. But um, what I will say is that um, during during um the lockdowns, what I saw New York City turn into during that whole entire process, I'm like, I'm absolutely done. Uh, I believe New York City has fallen as one of the greatest cities in the world. Of course, it's still stunning and a must see tourist destination but just yep you can't even drive in new york anymore it's if you go over 25 miles an hour boom express mail e-ticket directly to your door yep. uh so yep. it's so the new world order this wef agenda like you you look at new york and and you'll see it full-fledged right it's, it's yep huge. and that's that's again like even though i'm i I'm positive in the United States of America, we can isolate places indefinitely. I would never want to be there. New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, get the fuck out of those places. Like, mm. but look at how much just open land is in America. Think about Wyoming, Montana, Dakotas. Yep. I mean, even most of Utah, this place is amazing during the whole pandemic. Like you could be pretty much free operating your business as normal. So yes, mm -hmm. when we talk about America, we're talking about a humongous piece of land with 300 plus million people. You know, mm -hmm. we're not talking about Denmark. So when yeah. we think about part yeah. of that exit plan of like going somewhere where you're treated best, I, and again, I don't really know too much about the individual you spoke about or about what your particular plan is, but I'll just speak oh, for myself. Yeah. A lot of the time, based on the narrative, we hear that the better place, and then we look up what the better place is usually about. It's socialist as shit. So like yeah, you're yeah, trading yeah. off one thing for the other. Like, do I want to... The reason why it wasn't as a draconian of lockdowns in a place like Norway is because those people are already chipping their fucking hands. Yeah. So what do you... What do you... What is... The, what transition do they need to make? They could wake up tomorrow in Denmark and be like, hey, you're wearing CBDCs and they just go fucking ride their bikes. Mm -hmm. And I love Denmark, by the way. I they one of my best dinners I've ever eaten was in Copenhagen. So I'm mm -hmm. just speaking truth right now. When we mm -hmm. create these so-called exit plans of where to go and where to be, you know, have a better quality of life for our families and our loved ones and ourselves, if, if we're sing, sing, uh, single or whatever, flying solo, just be aware that like you got to go visit yourself. And that's where I'll end that. Go travel if you're somebody who's interested in getting out of where you are. Go travel if you can, you know, go feel the vibe. Don't just go with what people are saying is better yep. or you just yep. got to experience it for yourself, man, because I think too many people right now are sensational. It's a lot of sensationalization of, of destinations and they don't really know what the true experience is. Yeah. And uh, that makes them do rash, uh, just shit decisions. And I, I want people to be aware that no matter where you decide to go, it's the place you resonate with most that you're going to have the most harmony, regardless yeah. of the laws, regardless of the way people act, regardless of the quality of, you know, the, the real estate or it, it all becomes irrelevant if you're not happy there.
<laughs> you know, if you're depressed, but you're living in Whoville, then who fucking cares how nice and safe it is? It's hey, just, it gets thrown out the window. Agree, my friend. Well, and well, when I look at places like Dubai, I'm like, why would I ever want to live in a big technocratic, you know, it's so fake there that they need to shoot salt rockets into the inner earth's atmosphere to try to simulate rain. Get the fuck <laughs> out of here, bro. I don't want to live in a place like that. That's silly. Like, but if somebody is coming from, uh, you know, war torn wherever, and that's an opportunity for them, then awesome. In their in their position, it might be a great thing for them. So I'm just spe- I, I'm speaking to the individual right now. I'm letting people know, you know, just because you start hearing this place is good, that place is paradise, this, that, and the third. Like, it might not be your paradise. Yes, that's perfect. Perfectly said, my friend. Woo, man. What a trip. We've gone from, what have we gone from? We've gone from Dubai is the, is the epicenter of fake rain to, <laughs> to, the, to the eye of the tiger to, <laughs> to follow the white rabbit. Hey, we've gone on a mission, my friend, but I think, I think a lot of people are really enjoying this one for sure. Um, yeah, man. I, well, I got the time. If you want to get to some other questions, um, I'm more than willing to answer them. Sure. Let's do it. So somebody asked, why does Waters Above use the Wyckoff me- method for TA and not use other methods? What's so special about Wyckoff that it's superior for crypto? Great question. Well, it's not necessarily that it's superior just for crypto. It's just it is a very simplified and basic way to be able to detect where you are in the market. So I'll put it like this. I like to call Wyckoff method the market compass. And if I was to like, you know, throw you in the trunk of my car and drop you off in the middle of the forest, you'd have no fucking clue where you are. And a Mm. lot of people, when they pull up charts, that is essentially what they're experiencing. And that's why they need to rely on analysts or they need to rely on people who know about uh, macroeconomics. So with me learning and teaching myself Wyckoff method, I learned that I could actually pull up any chart in any time frame, regardless of the asset class, and I will be able to detect where am I at in this cycle, meaning where am I most likely to go next? So it clears the confusion of what I'm currently experiencing and how to prepare myself or predict what's going to be coming um, tomorrow. The other thing, the other thing I'll say is that do not pick more than one mentor. Mm. Okay. So I learned this very early on. It's okay to have multiple mentors if you've gotten yourself for the most part, self-reliant in one of those fields that you're interested in or passionate about. Mm -hmm. But when you want to learn from five different people about the same subject, you're not going to learn a single fucking thing. Yeah. So if you want to study Gann and Wyckoff and you know Peter Lynch and you want to do that, then have fun. But what I've learned as somebody, and by the way, I'm a I was an educator in all of my career fields before I got to this place today. So mm-hmm. I have a lot of experience as a teacher's teacher. I'm somebody who teaches teachers, and that experience for me has helped me uh, dramatically. And being able to find the single person that their message resonates with me the most. And I know that I need to pause and focus on what they have to say and mute out everything else. Even if other people are accurate or they say, you know, important information or they've made good calls in the past, uh, it's just part of that process of becoming a master is not about listening to 20 other masters ways of, uh, you know, skinning the cat. Mm, Yeah. You got to just select one. So for me, I got very, very lucky that I had the experience that I had in my professional career to know that when I got to technical analysis and cryptocurrency and helping people uh, build their portfolios, that I just got to stick to one methodology. And that actually helped me as a launch pad to create my own system, which anyone who does my crypto mastermind course or my advanced trading course, you'll see that although I use Wyckoff method, it's just one of my tools. Everything else becomes very unique. Um, but even my way of using Wyckoff method by default is quite unique because I'm using it in cryptocurrency. And Wyckoff wasn't alive for 90 something, 100 years uh, until cryptocurrency was invented. Um, so, you know, just by using his methodology in the crypto market requires you to be a little bit more open minded to the fact that this market is very volatile. And, mm-hmm. and Wyckoff was not working with as volatile of an, of an asset class, or they didn't even have fucking computers. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a great point. So I hope that thoroughly answers that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great, great answer. Um, somebody else asked, why would we want a bull run until crypto is utilized on a massive scale? I don't want fiat. <laughs> well, I want a bull run. I think everyone <laughs> prefers bull markets over bear markets for the most yeah. part, unless you want to accumulate. But um, I'll let you. Okay, well, let's clear. That. Yeah, let's clear a common misconception. Although you want fiat, it has no use. Like go to your local gas station and try, you know, what are you going to do? You have to convert from the Bitcoin or the XRP or whatever it is to the currency that is accepted. And as of right now, the currency that's accepted is fiat, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so if you have a bunch of silver one ounce coins in your pocket and you go to the grocery store and get to the checkout and they're like, okay, it's $47. And then you hand them two or three silver coins. The lady at the register is going to look at you and shrug and go, what the fuck are you paying with? We don't accept that. So we need fiat. And I think there's this like fetish that some people have in the crypto community to like be like anti fiat, but yeah. it's just a tool. Like, and one of the important things that everyone can learn is learn the rules of the game so that you could break them properly. Learn the rules mm -hmm. of the game so that you could play the game effectively. That's that beautiful. is wisdom right there. That's you know, beautiful. so like, don't hate fiat. It's like hating a crypto. You don't hate it. Don't date it. Just trade it. You know, use it the way that you need to use it at the time. But I know me and you, Bull, as business owners, fiat's fucking a great game to play in. Like, hey, you know, being yeah. in cash right now is is gorgeous. Why? I, who would want to sit in a crypto portfolio over the last year with a ninety five percent downtrend when you could have been in fiat? Hey, and <laughs> let me actually let me actually give a little bit of a lesson to people listening. Um, me, myself, I often tell people I'm allergic to fiat. I don't really like it that much, right? Like for, for reasons that a lot of crypto people believe it is a tool and I do know it's a tool. That's why I stress people to have cash flow coming in. So you have the ability to have the lifeblood of your financial veins pumping in and you have the ability to do things, right? But I don't like just holding it correct so actually around i think it was around september i really made an all-in kind of massive purchase of a lot of crypto believing that around there was uh the crypto bottom and we kept going lower we uh, still mm -hmm. at these relatively low values so what ends up happening is now my life is a little stagnant because i don't have that fiat available right because Correct. it's still it's, and and while you know it, it it could be viewed as a mistake i don't view it as a mistake but it is something that if i could do it over i would have waited till november right but i wouldn't have gone as all in as i did right so it's something to be very conscious of you you do need fiat uh unfortunately but it is a reality that we have. Right. Like, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, um, you know, bow down to the US dollar. I'm just letting people know that it's the cleanest, dirty laundry in the hamper. Mm. Oh my God. Dude, your sayings, I'm quoting them and I'm writing them twice. <laughs> I'm writing them I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad that you're taking, you know, these, these words, um, you know, seriously. I, I, I got to admit to everyone, like, this is a big change in mindset, you know, that I went through over the past couple of years, um, basically taking in all the far and one-sided direction quotes or statements that I heard people making people like Peter Schiff and, you know, even people like Michael, Michael Saylor and mm -hmm. not just trusting these people as if they're the walking Messiah of whatever of your hope mechanism. OK, so it works in both sides. And I think the conversation around fiat, I, I rarely ever hear people talk about it in the context of a Shemitah cycle. And that's mm. what I wanted my work to help people with over the past year and a half is to help people realize that we have charts showing us for almost a century of the market behavior. And if we have a pattern that we could detect and prove, and it's a cyclical pattern that's happening with accuracy, why would I go against that because of what Michael Saylor thinks? Mm -hmm. It's just, that's not you doing your own research and applying the research that you did. It's just you following somebody. So I don't care what these talking heads have to say. Like I have the skill to go into these charts or study the macroeconomic data, and then I can make choices on my own. And for me, I did not see anything bearish about the dollar in 2022. I just didn't. Mm. 
So that means it's a very clean, dirty laundry in this and, particular year. And, and now little... when... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, continue. Oh, I was just going to say that we talked a little bit before we made a joke together about QE and how that's like a positive thing for <laughs> investors, yeah, you know? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, there's going to be a time where I think that's going to hit. It's probably going to be into the end of 2023 this year um, because that's going to be their response to some sort of event that happens. Now, I think housing might also be part of this conversation, but I don't know if that opens up too many doors. Uh, but yeah, the housing market is ridiculous and super overinflated and something has to give with that. Yeah, I agree, my friend, just all throughout the board. Um, something I do want to ask, because this is very important as far as my exit strategy in crypto is, well, it's going to be kind of like a, there are going to be multiple prongs for this question. So I hope you're ready for this one. Um, the first one is, I believe in the ability of one having self-custody of their assets. Mm -hmm. I believe in, in self-custodying your crypto. And that was great advice, especially seeing the collapse of all these exchanges. However, I also believe in the self-custody of your own fiat, right? I believe in the very real and frightening scenarios of bail-ins. Right. I don't know when that could happen. I don't know what the reason they would give for that happening, but I, I do not trust my money in banks either. So something I've told my clients is that when I take profits from a good number of my crypto, something I'll be holding is USDC offline on my, on my mm. ledger. And also something else that I'm looking into heavily and trying to analyze is holding on to some profits in the form of PAX Gold which is a stable coin backed by gold one-to-one -one, and mm -hmm. they're yeah, fully heard audited and, and backed by the New York Department of Finance. So I do have a high level of trust in that specific stable coin. My question to you is, do you see any concerns with doing that? One. And two, gold versus fiat for profit-taking um, after a potential crypto bull run takes place. Because something that I've I've been questioning for a long time is that in 2008, when we saw the collapse of the stock market, we also saw the collapse of the price of gold, right? So that's something I've been grappling with for a long time. Should I take most of my profits that I get in crypto into fiat or should I look into getting into PAX gold? Wow. Um, so what I'll say is I think land, I, <laughs> I know think that was land, a loaded question, bro. I know, I know. No, 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 no. Like, let me get to one part of it and then we'll revisit the other part. So I think uh, it was a great question. And uh, I appreciate you even trusting in me with such a question because it, it requires quite an in-depth response. Yeah. And this is a personal preference at the end of the day, right? Like we could both agree on that. Mm -hmm. I actually think that it would be more advantageous to be uh, accumulating land and, and, and houses. That's mm. to me, that to me would be more advantageous than gold. But, um, if you're somebody who's already accomplished that part, uh, then perhaps gold would be, would be great too, as long as you have cash flow. So if you're not doing so, so well in the cash flow, then clearly you want to go cash. But if your cash flow is covered, then you maybe want to do the gold. And if you don't have any house houses or any land, then definitely get into that game because talk about tax liability benefits. I mean, you across the board, it's just going to help you so much, especially so, with these insane capital gains taxes that you have to deal with from crypto profits. So what I'll say is, and the reason I bring this up to kind of give you a, a bit of a different perspective as to why I asked this question is, um, mm -hmm. I really enjoy the idea of having liquidity within the crypto market, right? So when I say take profits into USDC and PAX Gold is because I'll have exposure during certain timeframes to the, to the price volatility of gold and also... Right. To the, to the stable fiat during times of crypto crashes, right? And then yeah. be able to quickly buy into that. So the reason I asked the question is, um, would you expect in the event of a crypto crash, whenever it is we see it for something mm -hmm. like gold to rise in value? I guess I well, um, and would yeah, be, well, I, and would it be I, like a, a net positive in your eyes to potentially have some exposure to that. 
Okay. So um, one thing is I don't know too much about PAX Gold from a charting perspective. I would have to like pull that up and see the correlation between that and the actual gold spot price or like the market price of gold. Cause then that would give me a better, uh, you know, I would it have a clearer picture same. of it should be the same. Oh, is it? It's one to one. And how long has, has PAX gold been trading for? Like Oof. how about, let me actually check that for you right now. Maybe yeah. Cause I'm not against gold. My only thing about gold is it's sort of sluggish, but I think it is, it's probably going to bode better in this particular economic climate that we're in. Uh, and during a Shemitah year, when shit's going horrible for the stock market, typically gold and precious metals in and of themselves perform pretty, pretty well. Uh, the only thing about gold is if we're looking at it for profit, for like investing and just having profit, then you're playing a real long and slow game. And if you're one of those people that likes that, then for sure, then play that game because it's going to be more conservative. I would rather be in gold than be in the stock market. Um, but if I was to look at things based on gold versus other things, I would much rather have land and, or I would just invest in business. I would continue to scale. <laughs> like so if I wanted under, to make profit, if I wanted to make profit, I would always consider just scaling business. That's the primary, primary force of generating cash. September, 2019, it's been trading. Okay. So that's very new. I mean, I have issues with some of this stuff regarding insurance and like backed by insert company name because they're not, none of them are trustworthy, you know, like not most of this shit isn't trustworthy. I'll give an example. The mint isn't even trustworthy. So oh, yeah. some people that, some <laughs> yeah. people that are buying gold and silver, like physically, and then they're keeping them at a mint or they're keeping contracts with the mint buying like essentially derivatives of this physical gold with the in the event of a catastrophic moment in society where they could go to the mint and then get their gold get the fuck out of here you think they're going to do that they're, that store won't even be open their doors will be sealed shut with military in front of it you're not going to mosey on into the mint and try to get your gold that you purchased it's ridiculous so yeah i mean i'm just saying that because i don't know too much about pax gold and and the concept behind how whatever so if you have it and you are keeping it on a hardware wallet, I suppose that's what it is. And then you could eventually convert it for the physical gold with what mechanism or what company, like what exactly is this thing backed by? So, so the reason I say this is not to hold it eternally, right? It's to mm -hmm. have liquidity within crypto, um, have gold exposure while at the same time having liquidity within crypto. So let's say hypothetically, we see one of those 30 to 35 percent days in the market where the market crashes in crypto right and you can use that as an opportunity maybe gold during that day goes up three four percent relative to just right, 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 right. see being stable that's kind of what i was getting at not because i want to hold pax gold into infinity and beyond i would rather right have, precious, or have the physical gold if i'm going to hold on to it but if if i want exposure to it while well, making like a some remote. sort of hedge play yeah 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 no it sounds like you have a great strategy i think that that could be extremely advantageous for sure i think that's an interesting strategy too um i haven't personally looked much into um doing that sort of play because it's just it hasn't been on my radar i think mm -hmm. the volatility of this market is so extreme and one thing i could also say is Whenever we have big market uh, moves to the downside, gold is not uh, safe. Like we saw what happened back in the C-19 crash, gold came right down. Um, so it's still uh, capable of being harmed during black swans. And I think that there's clearly a reason uh, to have some of it because, well, if you're able to use it in the crypto format digitally, then you could you could really make quick plays and 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 that allows you to do that strategy that you were talking about before yeah sounds interesting very nice thank you for that brother thank you i know that was a, a random one but it's something yeah it's hard to answer i mean i'm i'm really curious as to the future of stable coins like i'm very open-minded because there's so much theory out there and i'm sure you've covered it or have heard about like the idea of a tether collapse or 
you know, what stable coin, I'll, I'll share with you something and I would love to hear your, your thoughts. The two most common questions I get personally as, as a mentor on my client calls or in messages is that do you, what is the best stable coin to hold? Uh, that's number one. And uh, something regarding exchanges or hardware wallets. So yeah. that changed over the past six months. A year and a half ago, I was never getting that question. Now I'm getting that question all the time. You know, yeah. what is the next crypt? What's the next stable coin to depeg and go to zero? Is Tether going to collapse? Can I get a decode on when Tether is going to collapse? What's the best hardware wallet? Like it's all kind of in that uh, context. So what's your experience been like with that? Yeah, I've been a big purporter of the idea that Tether is a, the biggest Ponzi scheme in the world today. Um, it's mm -hmm. unbelievable to me that the, this company that's never been audited once has had the ability to claim that they have $80 billion of unbacked digital money on their, on their back. Like how? How? Where? Where can I redeem this Tether? For what? How? Right yeah. now, I know Circle and USDC, they're regulated, so I, I trust them. They're my stable coin of choice, but Tether, absolutely not. It's a racket. When it collapses, there's going to be some crypto liquidity problems because it's the biggest trade, trading pair, right? And I'm preparing for a potential Tether collapse. If it doesn't happen, thank the crypto gods. If somehow they come under compliance because they're tied into something, right? Some, some Illuminati thing where they can't fail because it'll bring down like the house of cards behind, I right. don't know. That's always possible because look at what's happening with SBF. Right? It's unbelievable. But what I'll right. tell you is that it's 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 clearly a racket. And what mm -hmm. I would say is choose choose USDC if you're going to have a stable coin that you take profits into. Can right. you use can you use the tether trading pairs just to make some crypto trades and moves in and out very quickly? Of course. But if you're going to hold Tether, you're, I'd have a lot of anxiety just holding Tether. Yeah, that's been my general uh, response. Like, I don't personally hold any Tether. Uh, but one of the things I've been telling people, and this is very deep, like, but I think it's something that's important regarding the philosophy and the market psychology is during the time that there was channels that were blowing up because all they spoke about was like tether and a possible tether collapse like one of them notably was that guy uh fuck what was his name uh excuse me he was the one crypt or uh, coffee zilla is that his name mm, he's a yeah, huge yeah. youtube channel and he was just coming out with all these videos about um you know about tether and how big of a scam it is and that gave it a lot of energy. Like we saw it became a much bigger conversation when he started getting involved and then other influencers in his particular, you know, category started blowing up with similar information and sharing similar videos. I say this because they were having you look over there, but the real collapse happened in Terra Luna stablecoin. So it's always like this fucking distraction shit that's going on. And now I'm not saying that it's impossible for Tether to collapse. And I just revealed to you a second ago that I don't hold any Tether. So it's not in my interest to promote it or anything. I do not promote it. I just think that they perpetuated that particular narrative and they allowed the algorithm to spread it like a cancer right at the time where they were planning the move that they were going to do, like the actual move. So it's a smoke and mirrors kind of thing. I hope that makes sense to people. I just, I have, I have so such an open mind to what the next thing is that's going to happen in crypto is. But if I was to create a list of a hierarchy of things that I think are about to undergo, the stable coin conversation is absolutely at the top of my list. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. And um, wow, we have too much stable coins in this market right now. And they were all kind of generated. Yeah, they were all kind of generated out of thin air. And uh, I believe even earlier when we were looking at the charts, I was telling you that that Binance chart is really too good to be true. And I think Binance's uh, stable coin is within the top 15. Hey, this I is ridiculous. Think, oh, no, think, it's like uh, it's number seven. Jesus, this is not good. I don't think CZ is out of the woods. I think if anything, CZ is going to be under the light of fire uh, in the not too distant future. Um, I don't know what. I don't know what his books look like, but hey, let me tell you something. The fact that it was him that brought down FTX and a lot of big, 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 important people were behind that that project for whatever it is they really used FTX yeah. for, that's not going to be good for him. So 
Uh, well, he has one thing that you guys, uh, that some people might not be considering that he has, which is he could be protected and under the wing of the entire Chinese Communist Party. And this is something I've revealed about Tether. Like I actually, and I know that's, this is very conspiratorial. So this is no, not something not. that it's I would, not. Like, I actually, this is uh, not something yeah. I would go touting around making content about, but I'm just being open-minded and I'm sharing a perspective that I don't think Tether is going anywhere because I think that they are part of the big cabal. Like they're just an extension of the central banking scam in and of itself. Like they are a too big to fail sort of operation because they were created by the elite. And uh, I think CZ, the Binance thing is definitely part of that overall conspiracy. Uh, so I'm intrigued by it all, and I'm starting to I'm starting to look at it as this big picture concept of almost like a defense mechanism, the manipulation that goes on with the stable coins to oh, so uh, usher. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, it's a wow. it's a wild theory, but it's something I've built upon through con like calls that I've had of people who come to me with information that I'm new to. But I I, I just you really that, like that that Binance, the Chinese exchange, right? Or like like or so someone someone in the head is Chinese exchange and then FTX gets taken down the main US one. Oh man, that's something. That's something. Well, I'm looking at it as he is a paid actor to play that role. So there he's just the talking head, kind of like an Elon Musk character. He's just given to us as the celebrity to play the talking, to be the face of the company. But the real people who are running the show, it's a totally different operation. The same thing goes with the miners, with the Bitcoin miners and that whole narrative around China and everything. So yeah, I mean, I, I think again, it's very conspiratorial. It's not something I would come out and make statements about, but it's a, it's a theory that I have. Um, I mean, look at what happened with Chase. You know, Chase Bank gets into all these things and they just get a slap on the wrist. They pay a fine and it's all good to go next week. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Man. And it why? Because they're in bed with the same people who print the money. So I think that the, the, the crypto market at the Bitcoin level and the USDT level, I think, it, and Binance, I think they're all in bed with the, because they're just, it's an extension or an instrument of the orchestra if you will like over there you have the brass section over there you got the percussion you know so on one side of it you have trafficking you have drugs like anytime people learn about the truth of money flow and who's so-called committing crime you'll learn that there's legitimate government poli poli political figures who are tied to it all the same people that are allegedly trying to stop drugs from crossing borders are the We're same people it. that are tipping off people to do it. Okay. It's all a show. Um, and that would, that would tell me that whatever events they're going to do in crypto, um, they're doing it on purpose, probably to affect, you know, the overall conditions of, of sentiment, not necessarily to uh, bring about the chaos in reality. It's to just make it difficult and confusing for retail, the, the market participants. Yeah. I'll tell you what, man, my, my perspective has definitely changed about life as a whole after today. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, Lord. Mm, I, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. It's been, I think it's been almost two and a half hours. Um, I could probably go for another six just to pick your brain, <laughs> <laughs> just to pick your brain about life at this point. But um, we got 95 people still here. I think what I'll do is I'll cut it here because that's a lot to unpack in itself, dude. Yeah, I mean, we could always do a round two in the future. Oh, hell yeah, man, dude. It's been amazing. It's a pleasure to get to just learn your mindset more and, and, and talk to you more, my friend, without a doubt. I'll definitely be messaging you offline. Just, uh, just pick your brain a little bit. But it's it's been my pleasure. Um, I hope everyone in the audience has enjoyed it as well. Uh, the replay will be made available on the university for those of you that are my clients. And a link will be sent to Waters Above for those of, of you in his community. So, um Thank you so much for taking the time out, man. It's been amazing. And um, yeah, let's do it again soon. Of course, brother. I appreciate you having me on. And to your community, appreciate y'all as well. Much love. All right. Much love, guys. Bye-bye.